A quick announcement to all our friends and uh, colleagues joining on the line. Um, we will be starting in approximately three minutes. Uh, please bear with us and we ask you to kindly mute your microphone when you join. My name is Fredros and I will be co-hosting this with uh, Dr. Sheila Ogoma. And we have a number of colleagues on the line as well who will be assisting, we will be introducing them in the meantime. So right now, most important is kindly mute your microphone when you join and please feel welcome, uh, a very warm welcome. Um, the good morning to people in, in, in um, the Atlantic and good evening to colleagues joining from the Pacific. Uh, good afternoon to colleagues joining from uh, uh, Africa. Uh, the class is oversubscribed. So once we hit a certain number, the rest of the attendees will be directed to our YouTube channel. Um, I'm asking any of my colleagues from Ifokara to kindly share the link to the YouTube channel. You can put that on the chat uh, uh, so that people can have that if they want to watch, um, stream and see this on, on YouTube as well. So again, we will be starting in two minutes, approximately two minutes.
Hello, Dave. I think we can begin. Good morning. A very good morning to you. Um, your coffee is probably getting cold, but... I have my handy hydro flask that I got at an IDM conference, so keeping it yeah. nice and tasty. Uh, did you guys, you guys still have physical conferences? No, this is an old one from years ago. Yeah. That's, that's, that's good. Uh, I'm going to request uh, just one last time um, our colleagues who are joining to uh, support, uh, to provide additional support for uh, David. Uh, please feel free to show your video. Uh, so sometime during the, the conversation, we can have an introduction as well. Um, so there are a number of people joining the call today to just support with a, a Q&A and to elevate some questions for David. And we are kindly inviting you to um, have your videos on. So again, my name is Fred Rus and uh, I'm from Ifakara Health Institute. Very, very happy to join with you today. Um, my co-host is Dr. Sheila Goma. So Sheila, please, if you, you can come online as well so we can begin. Hello, Fred. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks, everyone, for joining. David Smith, it's such an honor to have you today. We are looking forward to an interesting conversation today. Thanks, Sheila. Yes. Yeah. David, uh, uh, for many, many years, uh, the malaria people who work on malaria have known that, you know, we have I've had this idea that we can convert the problems that we have um, into some mathematical equations to be able to solve, to solve them going forward. And some of these ideas started with Ronald Rose in the early 1900s. And in, in, in some of your work, you've argued that actually there were people who worked very well with uh, uh, Professor Ross on this. Is it accurate for us to say that the idea of mathematics, of having math in malaria control is actually not a secondary thing, but a primary aspect of disease control? Is, is that accurate? Wow, that's an interesting one. Um, so so one thing to, to get clear up front was that Ross was mostly interested in transmission, not in disease. And so I think in understanding transmission, the mathematics have been an incredibly useful uh, tool, right? And this comes down to understanding what happens leading up to exposure. But I think disease is a different question. And uh, increasingly, as I've gone on my career, I realize how much we've neglected the disease side of things. Right. And I think there, I'm not sure mathematics have, have provided any really great insights, but in terms of transmission, I think, and as long as we can draw that distinction, I would think, yeah, in, in terms of controlling transmission, I think the mathematical models are probably the most important thing. So Make sure does... you, you have included, so you right. can see the big picture. It's not that they're the only thing, but you need to understand the, the sort of what's going on in this really complicated process. So how does that work? Does it mean then that uh, you would be building models for the infection side of things and a separate type of model for the disease side of, of things? Uh, well, they come together in one important quantity now. Right. So if we remember back, you know, it used to be people didn't get to treat malaria very well until about 1947 and chloroquine, you know, cheap chloroquine becomes available. And then over the decades, it gets taken up as cultural practice. People, you know, self-dosing with chloroquine or chloroquine and table salts. Certainly it became the, the first, um, first line therapy, but treatment has an effect on transmission in sort of these natural situations. It, it reduces mm -hmm. the reservoir. And so disease is important for transmission too. And that's one of the key th bits to get right. 
Um, but it's through this care seeking and care seeking is of course, horrifically complicated um, part of the process. Um, and I think some of the best work on this has been done you know, by many, many people in the world showing the relationship between sort of access to care, usually distance from a clinic or travel right. time and the propensity to treat. So I think if you know, we still see gradients in the real world and you know, how much people are treating and therefore how much drugs are interfering with the process of transmission. Uh, you know, so they're not wholly independent. But when it comes to questions like severe malaria, uh, I think you, know, it, you really can just take a question of uh, looking at exposure and, and, through, and then focusing on exposure through outcomes as almost an independent question. And that's partly because severe malaria is rare and, in, and by itself, probably one of the most important things and it's the condition that leads to death. Right. Uh, so, you know, that part, I think the, the burden, the heavy burden of, of malaria, rather than if I can call it that the light burden of malaria, the light burden of malaria means, you know, just what you get from being infected with malaria all the time, that sense of feeling right. unwell. So yeah. So, I mean, I, I noticed and, and, um, from your work that a, a very big part of your career has been uh, working, on, uh, working in Africa, uh, working with uh, malaria specifically. You've, you've done a number of other things. But I, I would like to begin actually a conversation with you about where did this all start? Um, uh, David, how did, you, how did you get involved with this? What's the first time you came to Africa? Um, why were you interested in this? If you could just begin by that, it, it would be an interesting part. Wow. Okay. So um, for people who you know don't know my career very well, I actually didn't start in malaria. I started working on parasitic plants when I was a graduate student. So there are these lovely organisms. Um, Indian paintbrush uh, is one of the organisms we see out here in the United States. It's, it's got these red bracts, beautiful organism. Um, mistletoes, sandalwoods, um, cascuta, striga, which is called a witchweed. So they're beautiful and sometimes economically important plants and I was fascinated with them. I wanted to know everything about parasitic plants. Um, mm -hmm. I loved them as a graduate student. And then I realized there wasn't a big future in it. <laughs> as a, as a, it was fun. It was great natural history, but um, I started to get more interested in other, you know, it was a parasite and in that sense, it, it had shared something at least minimally with malaria. But one day I was walking past the office of uh, Simon Levin, who was my advisor at Princeton. And they were, there was a, a visiting scholar, Zhirlan Fung from Purdue, who was sitting in, the, in his office doing nothing. And I knew she was visiting. So I said, hello, Zhirlan, what's going on? And she said, oh, we're just waiting for somebody to come. And they apparently had been waiting for a long time. I said, well, what do you, what's the meeting about? And they said, what's well, about malaria? I said, oh, that's interesting. And that was my very first meeting thinking about malaria as a research topic. And one of the first papers I wrote with Zhirlan was on um, sort of the time scales of malaria transmission and, and then the other the population genetics of sickle cell genes. Yeah. And that launched me into a career that it took a few years to get there. So the other detour was through thinking about nosocomial pathogens, uh, particularly antibiotic resistant ones, and the spatiotemporal dynamics of rabies. And uh, so the first say five years of my career were really, you know, focused on those other two topics. And, 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 and at what day, stage, at what malaria. stage then do you do you move to Africa? So I started um, I moved to the Fogarty International Center in 2003, okay. uh, partly with the instruction to work on malaria. And Simon Hay came to visit Fogarty and that was the very first time I'd seen some of his work on mapping malaria. And I became fascinated um, then with the possibility of understanding, you know, the distribution of malaria, like the real actual distribution of malaria instead of as a theoretical construct. Um, not to say we've solved that problem, but I became fascinated with it. And I started yeah. working with Simon and Simon invited me to go to Nairobi to uh, meet with him. So my first trip to Nairobi must've been around 2000, 
2004 or 2005, sometime around then. And, I, and I've been back to Africa at least once a year ever since, except for COVID. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I've enjoyed my trips to Africa. Yeah, as, as, as you notice, uh, Professor Noor is on the call today and uh, you guys spent a lot of time together. So we're going we're gonna, to uh, dive uh, straight onto the, the, the core of today's topic. A lot of my colleagues attending the call are medical entomologists. There are a number who are clinicians as well, a number who are policy staff, uh, people actively working on malaria control. Dave, this is a publication that came out in 1980. And this is the first time that WHO described the terminology entomological inoculation rate. This is the first time EIR is put in writing. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a paper that I actually only just, just read. I've never read it, but I read it because, because of, the, of you actually. The quantities that are put here, the, the, the argument in the paper was that there is a malaria epidemiological equilibrium and it changes only if any of these quantities uh, shift in a meaningful way. Now, a question to us uh, from from uh, from us is: Is there anything missing from that list, or was it already complete uh, by the time the WHO put it in place in 1980? So, so let me go back and and say this was the first time the quantity was named EIR, but it's not the first time it was actually studied. So, you, you know, it goes back to an idea that Ross introduced. He said you needed to be able to measure exposure. And by 1933, there's this very lovely paper by Davy and Gordon. And they, what they've done is, uh, this is um, in Sierra Leone, they, they calculated the infective biting density, right? So they were counting mosquitoes as they attempted to blood feed in a house. And they were trying to measure exposure by, you know, computing the EIR essentially was what we would call it now in its various guises. So already by 1933, that idea was, was sort of codified and part of the research agenda and was sort of the standard practice. So if you move forward, it was actually, you know, McDonald disrupted that with this notion of vectorial capacity and the yeah. ability to measure these individual uh, bionomic parameters, you know, the blood feeding rate, the uh, survival, uh, survival through the extrinsic incubation period and so forth. And uh, it was then later that Garrett Jones comes in and looks at, um, it names a parameter that sort of, that, mosquito, that people in the field had already been measuring and that was the human blood index. And so then we have this sort of modern notion of vectorial capacity. And what Anori and Grab do, do <clears throat> is they yank the, 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 the narrative back from that parameter-centered view of transmission to a field-centered view of transmission. And they argue that EIR is the right whole measure of exposure right. uh, because it's something you can measure in the field. What had happened is that there'd been this drift from McDonald through Garrett Jones and others to try and measure yeah. these parameters and then come up with a reassemble a picture of transmission that was based on those parameters. But, uh, but you know, what people had started to show is that that view of the world is fraught with error. It's really difficult to do. It requires several different estimates. When each one of them has their errors, when you start putting them back together, who knows what the, right. you know, the error propagation is. So even though EIR has its, its own faults, we can certainly discuss those at length, it's probably a better way of getting a, a, an accurate picture of transmission than this parametric view through vectorial capacity. And I think with mathematicians, the vectorial capacity view lingers and you still see publications about it. But I think yeah. for a long time now, people have not really tried to assemble a picture of transmission from the individual program. They'll discuss them. They'll look at sensitivity to this so, or that, an interesting yeah, so fact. This is, this is an interesting point you raise actually, because for, for, for many medical entomologists working on malaria or many clinicians, the term vectorial capacity is quite opaque. It's, it's quite a, a difficult thing to, to grasp. So I think most people have just gone with EIR, entomological inoculation rates. And, and sometime during this conversation, uh, Sheila and myself are going to ask you a lot of questions about the relationships between these terms. Um, so Dave, I think 
an important point to jump to then is you are part of the 2011 uh, Malera um, uh, research agenda. Uh, uh, you participated in that and, and you are part of the modeling group. In um, 2016, 20, 2016, 2017, the Malera refresh uh, was done. And, and this time they combined modeling with the idea of combining interventions. Now, if you look at that figure there, you see at the top a set of measures, including EIR, of course, and then a set of parasitological estimates, uh, plasmodium uh, falciparum parasite uh, rates, and then you have API and the weekly cases as well. What is interesting for us, we, we had a, a, a class with, uh, with uh, Professor Tom Barkert recently, and we were talking about variability around EIR. Now, what's interesting in this Malera document is that the rest of the measures have uncertainty estimates around it. EIR somehow doesn't. <laughs> yes. uh, and yet it is perhaps the most imprecise. Um, yeah. What would you say about this, uh, uh, Dev? It's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic point. Um, we have uh, on occasion produced uncertainty estimates around the EIR, but I think the entomologists have done, you know, what's, there's statistical uncertainty and then there's real uncertainty. And part of the problem with EIR is um, we don't really know how to measure exposure. Um, what we do is, you know, with the, the classic, what's called the gold standard, when we put, you know, two people outdoors and they expose their legs and they catch the mosquitoes trying to land, you know, the human landing catch is um, the, probably the best uh, way of saying under those conditions, how often do mosquitoes approach a human? So the human landing catches is good, but, but um, you know, that's not what people, that's not how people are behaving. And there's a lot of heterogeneity mm -hmm. moving around. Um, and so I, th I think, you know, there are these other measures. And when you look at those measures and you compare them to each other, like CDC light traps versus pyrethroid spray catches, you know, with exit traps, you're finding that you get different answers and that the answers differ quite a bit from each other. And so, um, so this is the estimates of the human biting rate, right? So how yeah. many mosquitoes are trying, and those are, are very difficult to measure accurately. So we could actually, and we should produce statistical estimates of uncertainty around the HBR, um, or at least around our counts data. So you're counting mosquitoes, right? So that should be a, become a regular part of the entomological uh, publishing standards. But um, the other part is the, the uncertainty on the uh, sporozoite rate, which is also tends to be a lot less variable, but very low. So yeah. there are different statistical estimates. And whenever I've kind of tried to produce a, a sporozoite rate estimate myself, even with, you know, in studies where there's lots of data, you find that it's really hard to get, you know, to see the patterns in the sporozoite rate unless you smooth over a very long period of time. Right. So, um, so it's a messy statistic and there is statistical uncertainty, but more to the point, there's this, other source of uncertainty, which is how accurate is it as a measure of exposure really? Um, and I think, you know, that goes back to trying to think about measuring exposure as a way of sort of understanding disease. I would actually like to push this in one direction, which is to say, we ought to be thinking differently perhaps about the way we measure mosquito populations for purposes of surveillance. And that, um, you know, do we really need a measure of individual level exposure or are we trying to surveil some aspect of the mosquito population that helps guide a decision? If those are the same thing, fine, but if they're different things, I think we really would rather have the yeah. information that helps us guide a decision, in which case we don't need accurate estimates of individual level exposure. Um, so, and so, meanwhile, there's all of this slop that we can't really, yeah. you know, but I will say one other thing, which is right. that even though the EIR is um, the accuracy of entomological inoculation rate estimates is called into question, 
the, there's so much variability in the EIR over the, you know, in places where malaria is being transmitted that even if you're off by a factor of say three or five, I mean a 300% or 500% error, mm -hmm. you're still in the right neighborhood. You're, you're still in the ballpark. Okay. Measure. <laughs> I, I, th I still think it's useful, even though it's, you know, there's a lot of error. And you know, how close does it have to be to be good enough is a really interesting yeah. question to apply the EIR. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll show some examples here just to get explanations from you. Uh, as, as there are three other questions on that line, and very quickly, I would like us to go over them. The first one is, uh, and please don't mind that we haven't described these equations yet because that's going to come. It's often argued that reducing R0 to below 1 is a good threshold for uh, local elimination. What would you say is the equivalent threshold? Or do we even have a threshold for EIR actually? Um, According to this table, they, they unite at zero. Beyond that, there doesn't seem to be any unity. So let me say two things about this. The first is that it is a threshold for elimination in a closed population, not an open one. Uh -huh. so, if you're in Malabo, in Equatorial Guinea, where prevalence is hovering around 10% and has for the last five years, despite intensive vector control, the, um, the answer is probably that at least some of the malaria you're seeing is coming from people traveling off island. Right? Right. And islands are easy to see this, but it works everywhere. On an island, when you leave and get infected and come back, you import it you know, across this water barrier, and so it, we can call it importation, but the same thing work, works over land barriers where people are traveling far away and coming home. So it's not a threshold for elimination in an open population. And that is, okay. you know, the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that um, it, it's to go into that relationship between vectorial capacity and EIR, which you hinted at earlier, because R0 is closer to vectorial capacity an EIR is closer to an actual field measure of exposure. And the, the, the relationship between the two is um, mathematically, I could write it down, but it helps to actually understand the concept that was originally motivating vectorial capacity. And it, the, in, in, in that original paper by Garrett Jones, he called it the daily reproductive rate. And Correct. he said it was the number of infectious mosquitoes arising that would arise from all the mosquitoes blood feeding on a single human on a single day. And entomological inoculation rate is the number of bites received by a person on a single day. So bites arising, vectorial capacity and bites received actually differ in one key aspect. And, and for this, I have to backtrack and say, we compute vectorial capacity under a very rarefied condition. We assume that people are perfectly infectious. And by assuming that they're perfectly infectious, we can then take a, the complex part of the infectiousness and push it off to a different thing, you know, to the epidemiologists, let them worry about fluctuating gametocyte densities. And we'll just focus on the mosquitoes. But EIR is obviously taking that into account. So the big difference is what we call net infectiousness of the, of the human reservoir. So how, how, what's the fraction of mosquitoes that became infected after blood feeding? Right. So those two, there's a non-linearity, but they're, they're very approximately almost linear relationship between those two quantities. And that, actually you know, one other quantity that, is the one that comes out. I think that we, we, have, we have a, um, a, a chance to explain that in the, in the next slide actually. So, Shela, if you don't mind, I'll skip the last question so that, go ahead, Dave. So, so you want to think of vectorial capacity as a measure of potential transmission. Right. And EIR is a measure of actual transmission. Wow. And so okay. what happens is you reduce the potential for transmission, then you have this feedback loop where people are getting infected less, they're becoming less infectious, and, and the forozoite rate starts to drop as well as the, the HBR. And eventually you reach this point where 
things would go away if you were in a closed population. So EIR, once you, once you reduce the threshold of vectorial capacity, EIR drops sharply in a closed population, whereas vectorial capacity is sort of declining sort of linearly. And that's, right. so they, there's a, a, especially right around where we would say R naught equals one, the threshold, the, there's a big, there's a sharp nonlinearity in that relationship. And the sharpness depends on how much imported molarity. If you have zero, it's very sharp. If you have and, a lot, then it's, it's not very sharp at all. And at some point, we're going to ask you what exactly you mean when you say closed population. Uh, oh, it's, so, an, it's an so artificial it's, construct where nobody moves in and out. <laughs> yeah, so, so hold that thought as well. Uh, there were some challenges that were addressed um, uh, regarding models, but I'm going to skip that for purposes for the sake of time and I invite my colleague Shayla to uh, take on the next one. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, we've been talking a lot about vectorial capacity and EIR without really going deeper into what the parameters of these equations are. So, and I know in the next slides, we are going to be looking at these equations in more, equations in more detail. I think, Dev, um, it would be really nice for you to sort of explain in really very, very simple terms for us what these parameters um, are that are involved in, in the life cycle of malaria transmission. Just very, very simply, just for a background as we go into the equations. All right. Well, let me start from the left-hand side and look at two, the, the two terms, the, the lambda, mosquito density, and mosquito death rate. So the first part is to understand Mosquitoes are emerging, we call it, a, uh, it's an emergence rate really because adults are coming out of the aquatic habitats and entering the volant population, flying around and blood feeding and they're dying at some rate. And this is what determines the number of mosquitoes that are out there in the population. So lambda and G are essentially determining, you know, that. G, that the death rate is just, it, it's, what determines the, the lifespan of a mosquito? So the easiest way to think of the relationship between a rate and a lifespan in this model is you take one over G. So if, if you have a 10 day lifespan, G is, is uh, 0.1. And it's very close to saying the proportion of mosquitoes that survive each day is about 90%. Mm -hmm. So that's the way to think about that parameter. So that's that part. And then mosquitoes start blood feeding and they can blood feed on anything, uh, any vertebrate animal. So that's F. So how many times a day does a mosquito blood feed? So this could be, you know, anywhere between a little more than a day or two up to a much longer period, depending on the species and the conditions. And some fraction of those bites are taking place on a human. So that's few in this model. And so you get this notion of how many, how many people are being bitten per day. And that's called the human biting rate, if you, if you measure it per person. And that's the product of, of sort of the number of mosquitoes, so lambda over G and F over Q. So that's not how McDonald wrote it down originally. But, um, but I think it's the, the easiest way to see it. And I want to introduce one other term called, it's the ratio. If you take in the numerator F and Q and in the denominator G, what you're yeah. actually getting is a term that says, this is how many mosquito or how many humans a mosquito would bite over its lifetime. So, right. I mean, throw out some regular uh, numbers. Let's say a mosquito feeds once every three days and it leads, you know, 90% of the bites are on a, uh, a human or 95%, and it lives about 12 days on average, or let's say 20 days, uh, let, I don't care. What you get is, let's say, let's say three days, 95% and 12 days, it means that it would take about around four, it's actually three point something less than four, but it's very close to four bites on a human over its lifetime, lifespan. Now this becomes very important because it takes two bites to complete the, the cycle. And this is where right. we have this B and C, which are not part of vectorial capacity, but part of transmission. So the other part that is part of vectorial capacity is after mosquito becomes infected, it has to survive long enough for those, uh, 
initially gametocytes, which then develop into other life forms implanted in the mosquito butt, uh, gut, migrate through the hemocele up into the salivary glands where they're present. And that takes probably longer than nine, could be very long depending on temperature days. And so some, only some fraction of mosquitoes survive long enough to, to survive, right? So the best way to understand vectorial capacity is it's the product of all of these things in a particular way that's trying to describe the potential for transmission. Right. I want to put it in, in very simple terms and tell you it's actually the product of that thing on the left, how many mosquitoes are emerging per human per day. That quantity I told you about, the number of bites on a human, because that's, that's what says that's the probability, something to do with the probability of getting infected the first time. There's another term that says how, what's the fraction that survived through the extrinsic incubation period. And then after that, they have to give more bites to infect a human. So that's, other, that's that other human biting term. Yeah. So if you take the product of that, the S twice, probability of surviving through the extrinsic incubation period in Lambda, you get a measure of essentially the total number of infectious bites that would eventually arise from all the mosquitoes blood feeding on a single human on a single day. And it turns so, out to be that quantity that's very closely related to the EIR. So, so some of the descriptions you have, uh, um, Dave, emanate from, I, I believe, the, the, the paper that you and uh, Ellis McKenzie wrote, uh, revisiting the r naught question. But, if, but before we go to that, uh, I want us uh, uh, to go back to the, the very original uh, McDonald equation, probably not the the very original one. So this is the 1955 one. Uh, uh, and when R naught was still called Z naught for some reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In literature, you find this Z uh, value, which uh, is, is actually R naught. So at, at this point, so the, the questions are down there and you could, you could just help us with the X is the uh, proportion of mosquitoes that are not infected yet. So, um, um, that eventually, you know, when you X have the sporozoic rate in that, yeah. So, so as that goes goes low, eventually you just remain with this side of the equation. Yeah. So, oh, I know that you, I know that you guys have uh, improved this quite a bit, but could you use this to explain exactly the same thing that you're saying to put in these equations? Yeah. So, um, the first thing is to say that. If you're a mathematician, um, this is an annoying formula because it, what's clear is that McDonald formulated this using one kind of mathematics and then to explain it to people, he translated it into another. So the probability of surviving one day, P, is related to that term I put in there, G, daily survivorship, in, uh, by a formula G equals negative ln of P, right? And so the log EP, the natural log of P in the denominator is essentially one over that is the lifespan of a mosquito. Right. And if he had formulated this as a daily time step model, then it would, that would be a one minus P, P over one minus P, because that's how you get the average lifespan of a mosquito in a geometrically distributed model. But he didn't, and he put it this way, and it introduces a confusing thing about uh, a units problem, if you're going to get into it. So, um, so you know, if you if you put p to the n, it's the probability of surviving n days, right? And over ln of p. So in our in the other languages, that would be e to the minus g n over g. So that those terms are essentially equivalent. By the way, it's minus ln of p because p is you know, anyway. So so that's why you get the negative number. So I'm looking at the formula two. Right, that's the right hand side, p to the n over a negative ln of p. The other two terms that have to do with mosquitoes are m and a squared. So m, in his notion, m a is the human biting rate, and a is the the human feeding rate. So in in our terms, it would be the product of f and q, and it was later that that, that got introduced. So McDonald wasn't really thinking about 
uh, anthropophily at all. That was that right. came into later. So he's just thinking about human blood feeding as a as a term. So that's how the three the, the two are related. Um, not sure that helps. So if if I, if I had a chalkboard, can I write? I don't know. I wish I, I had it. This, this is where chalkboards and mathematicians become very good friends. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 fine. But if you want if you want your uh, uh, earlier diagrams, uh, uh, Sheila can can move to the next slide. I think Sheila, you have a, the question that you're going to ask Dave was this. Dave, is that what you're looking for? I like this. This was this comes from McDonald's paper in 1960. Let me remember. We, it's like 61, where he right. had also he'd applied it to um, similar equations. He'd applied to schistosomes, and he'd come up with this this general notion of R not for parasites. This was his uh, his figure, and we we basically cribbed this and put it into ours later. But uh, essentially, what you're doing is tracing mosquito, tracing the process of transmission through that life cycle, parasite life cycle, and putting names on each one of the steps that has to happen. And um, it, you know, so how many mosquitoes are bitten is at the top? So that's the human biting rate. That's MA. Right. So mosquitoes per human per day times the number of bites per mosquito is the number of bites per human per day. They then have to survive uh, the end days of the extrinsic incubation period. That's the uh, at two o'clock. At four o'clock, how long does the mosquito live after it becomes infected? I'm oh, sorry, infective. Uh, how many bites does it give? So that A over negative L and a P. How many infections are produced? right? B. So that's the probability of causing an infection per infective bite. And then this is this one over R, it's part we haven't talked about. It's the duration of an infection. And there are arguably other terms that belong here, but that, that is the product of this. So counting through, it's the number of parasite infections, um, let's say any human, per infected human. That's how many humans per human would become infected after you work through one or the life cycle. And if you start at a different part, you can count the number of mosquitoes per mosquito. It's the same thing in this formula. Right. So I, I guess that, you know, you, you move you move then from, from this and, and it's at, at this stage, we're still really just talking about the R naught. Um, uh, and it, it's, it's wonderful that we have that introductory, uh, you know, uh, explanation of what this, the, these terms are. So maybe uh, Shela, we can move on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've been referring to R not quite a bit, um, but would like to understand like how does R not? Um, wh why is there a variation across different endemic regions in uh, in Africa? That's a really good question. I think that there are two points here that I would I would sort of separate out. One is the underlying biology of the mosquito species or the population, and it's you know, it's biological traits, they give it a preference. So for example, Anopheles gambia likes to bite indoors, it likes to bite humans. And if you were to go somewhere outside of Africa, you'd find, a, you'd find species that, are, that don't like humans as much. So some of those things are species specific differences and they affect the parameters, you know, how long does a mosquito live? Uh, what fraction of bites occur on a human? How frequently does it blood feed and so on? So those kinds of traits are species specific traits, but there are other terms in this, and it's mainly this little M that are coming from the mosquito ecology. Uh, you know, how much water is there? Uh, how close is the water to humans and so on and so forth that determines the number of mosquitoes per human. So those ecological factors are probably responsible for most of the variability in transmission across the range, especially within Africa where all of the well, most of the vectors are tend to really like to bite humans, so that's not a huge difference. Um, but ecology, I think, is the biggest difference in uh, transmission intensity. Mosquito ecology is specifically what I mean. Yeah, and and when in publications you come across R naught and R C, 
uh, when does R not shift to become RC? What are the differences between the two? So we, oh, <laughs> I'm going to apologize for mathematicians a bit because we, we create <laughs> these artificial environments where everything is simple. Um, it makes the it makes the math work out easier, but then it becomes harder to explain how relevant it is. So uh, in this case, R naught is referring to this weird condition where there's no immunity, and uh, it's a closed population, and constant conditions, and I get this measure of uh, how many cases uh, one case would generate as as malaria was spreading epidemically at the beginning of of a uh, an invasion process. So in a population where there's never been malaria and you introduce the parasite and it explodes. So this never happens yeah. or rarely happens, but that's what we sort of, we try to understand the whole system by looking at those restricted conditions because it, it gives us some sharp insights. R0 though is always computed in the absence of any vector control and any drug, you know, any care seeking. So it doesn't include any, any factors related to malaria control. And R, RC acknowledges that when you try to measure or estimate it in the field, those things are operating and reducing transmission. So RC means it's essentially the same thing as R0. It's, it's trying to ignore immunity or at least correct for it, but it's also taking into account the fact that there is vector control and it's reducing mosquito populations. So RC is a more general term because it applies, you know, it's specified, it applies to any level of control that's happening in a population at some point in time, whereas R0 is in that limit where there's no control. Probably yeah. almost more in the world right now. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So does RC also include um, um, medication like the chemoprophylaxis? Uh, yeah, and all of those things that are reducing transmission in it. It's not just the control. Okay. Yeah. And uh, back to the first question, Deb, from your experience, how wide is this variation? Is, is it, what is the maximum R0 that you guys have observed? When McDonald and Draper, in that paper you flashed up a couple of slides ago, when they went out and tried to measure it in uh, Eastern Africa, in the 1950s, yeah. they were, their initial estimates were that it was on the name on the order of more than 2,000. So wow. uh, if you go back and sort of crank their numbers, yeah, it, it's that high. And and you know in places like Apache, uh, Uganda, which is the highest place, highest estimate of EIR ever measured, it's around 1,500. Uh, places like that, you know, there's so many mosquitoes. Um, that it, you'd probably have to reduce mosquito populations by a factor of 3,000, which is kind of what we mean by R0 in this context. Now, there's an important thing, and there may not be 3,000 people living around you. So when we talk about R0 as an expected number, okay. it doesn't really make sense in, in sparse, sparsely populated areas to think about it as an expected number of humans, because you can't have 3,000 people infected when you only have 100 neighbors. So um, you have to actually be very careful when you start to apply this in particular situations is to say, what do you actually mean by R0? And it's not just the small population bits. It's spatial heterogeneity, it's the seasonality, it's uh, a number of other factors and the math gets really hard very fast. So you wanna stay away from, you know, the, the rigorous mathematics in these situations, but you want to understand how that's affecting your estimates, I, I, I would argue. Um, Thank you. And yeah. it doesn't always work in the way you would think, but um, I'm not going to, I can come back to that later, just just yeah. to say that, um, you know, uh, it does get fairly complicated fairly quickly mathematically. And, but that's the reality of the world, right? When we start to try to take the math and use it in these situations where um, yeah. we violated all of those friendly assumptions that make the math easy for us mathematicians, we start to have to account for that, at least in when we start to try to apply the ideas in context. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you, um, 
to mention maybe just one or two examples of how we can apply r not in malaria programs? I think that's a really good question. Um, I, I, biggest problem in malaria is that it's not a what you see is what you get. So for those of us who are young enough to remember the early days of computers, <laughs> We used to have these word processors that like word perfect and even the early days of word, which were what you not WYSIWYG. You'd see one thing on the screen and then you had to typeset it to see what your document looked like. And word, or this was a, and then the later versions of word perfect were WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Malaria is not what you see is what you get. When you measure it, let's say you go out and you try to measure transmission by taking a prevalence measure or an EIR measure or, or this or that, um, serology, API. All of these measures are telling you, you know, useful information, but all of the estimates have errors associated with them. You measure it at a particular time in a particular place. And, and so if you were to try to piece together entomological surveillance, parasitological surveillance, clinical surveillance to get a, a, a big picture of transmission, you want to tie them all together in some way. And that picture of what you're tying together needs to be either one of the things that you've already measured. So you're trying to convert PR onto EIR, or you're trying to, you know, serology onto EIR or you're trying to map them onto some other quantity that's related to all of them. And I would argue that the reason we should use R0 is that it is a metric that works across the spectrum and is meaningful and pretty easy to understand as long as you take it at the right level of abstraction. It's the number of cases per case. And there are these thresholds that exist and the goal of a program is to push malaria below the threshold. And sure, there are measurement errors, but there are measurement errors across the board. But R0 is an, or an RC is a measure that you can understand and apply in every context. If you're in a very, very low transmission setting, like that's what Tini is today, most of the cases that you see are either imported or recently traced back, traceable back to an imported case. And in those cases, there are methods for estimating RC but prevalence is nearly zero. EIR is almost impossible to measure. And you know, you're know you just seeing the cases in the clinic. If you take it to the other extreme, very uh, intensive transmission, uh, say Western Africa today in many areas, even under control, then you, want, you probably want to understand the magnitude of your problem by measuring the EIR. Yeah. Well, that's also easily converted into RC. And so you have this sort of measure that works across the spectrum of transmission. And it, and it helps you interpret and align your results. And you say, well, what about PR? PR is the one that almost everyone measures almost all the time. Well, sure. But when you see prevalence in a population, it's been reduced by treatment by, to, to some extent. And that's a different extent in different places. And clinical surveillance, yeah, that's great data. You get it all the time. It's, it's plentiful. But then there's this care-seeking layer that, you know, not everyone who got malaria, who got sick, came to the clinic. Not everyone got sick. Not everyone who got sick came to the clinic. So these enormous biases in the reporting rates. So you're saying each, each one of these statistics is telling you a part of the big picture. But it, they all need to be put together into this coherent statement about transmission. To, if you're thinking about... And let me go back to one of my initial points. If you're thinking about reducing transmission, if that's your programmatic goal, so you can reduce exposure, then, then RC is your right measure. I would argue again, and we can't, and I, I don't want to lose sight of this, that if you just give people better access to healthcare, you can probably reduce disease substantially, even if you don't manage to reduce transmission. And the example here is, you know, I've been working with a team at UCSF, and they've been working in Uganda for years doing clinical trials of various sorts, HIV, TB, and malaria. And in those trials, they always give this, the, the, the study protocol gives access to people, uh, very good medical access to people, so that if they're enrolled in the study, they show up at the clinic, they go down to a special clinic, they don't have to wait in line, uh, and they get reimbursed for their travel. 
And under these conditions, you know, with, I don't know how many person years of study they have, but I think it probably approaching about a million person years of study over these years, they have seen a very, very low number of severe malaria cases and a low number of deaths. So I think it's important to remember that if you treat promptly every case of malaria, you're not gonna see as much severe malaria. You're gonna prevent it before it even forms. And that's a really important thing about disease control. So disease and transmission are probably scaling differently depending on how much really good access to care you have. But all that being said, for transmission, it's R, something like RC would be really good. And, and when we go into this, remember, if you're trying to measure something, when we go back to EIR, they, we don't report error estimates. But EIR is hugely problematic at low intensity. It's very, very hard to measure EIR accurately when it gets low because you just have to catch so many mosquitoes to find a few infectious ones. We, we, we will get to we will get to this uh, uh, specific point about EIR, uh, but but first let's let's conclude uh, one simple issue here with uh, uh, the R naught. So earlier on you were saying that you know the R naught is measured with some assumptions around immunity and, and some assumptions around heterogeneity. But when you actually collect the data, you see this huge variation. And I would like you to kindly speak to us a little bit about how the so-called heterogeneity and immunity influence uh, uh, are not measurements. Yeah, it's, it's, it gets pretty complicated if you start with the human epidemiology. It's right. It gets horrifically complicated. The, 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 the graph that we have actually is a correlation with EIR, so we could explain it from the, from the transmission side. Yeah, that's what I was gonna segue to, is to say, when you look at the mosquito epidemiology, it's actually much less complicated. So aside from that question of what fraction of mosquitoes become infected, which is not a trivial concern, I'm not trying to downplay that, but you know, there is maybe even immunity even in, in the mosquito populations, but they're short-lived um, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the concerns you have immunity don't apply when you're trying to measure transmission through the mosquitoes. So right. in the formulas, aside from that one term, that describes the net infectiousness, EIR and vectorial capacity are you know, essentially linear. And so if you were to take you know, EIR and try to use it to estimate RC in a population, the only thing you really need to have is an estimate of net infectiousness in that population, which is, I'm not gonna downplay it, it's still very hard to measure, but it, you know, we're not talking about orders of magnitude of error in net infectious, mm -hmm. we're talking about small, smaller, even if it's a factor of two or five, you know, we're looking at variability on this axis of annual EIR that's spanning five orders of magnitude or 10,000 or 100,000, right? In, in natural areas where transmission is being taken place. So two is pretty small error relative to everything else. So it, the argument is if you wanna know RC, the best, single measure is EIR. It's the most accurate. It's the closest, directly closest, except for when you get to very, very low transmission, when you can actually, you, you've erased all of the concerns about immunity and RC, now in this area where RC is well below one, you have a different methodology that works fine, but at a higher transmission intensity, it's the annual EIR is by far, or at least from a priori considerations, by far your best measure of uh, estimating transmission. No, th thanks a lot. I think that uh, in, in, given the, the explanation that you have, uh, perhaps the best thing for us to do is to jump to uh, the concept of this variability, to jump on, into how this variability actually plays out into the field. And for this reason, I would like us to have a brief discussion about uh, you know, a subject that you've worked on for a long time and with, with several colleagues around hotspots. Um, so you have these huge areas, uh, some of them have very high transmission, some of them have very low transmission, and you've been alluding to this, and I think it's important for us to you know, just go straight into that. So I'm going to ask you a few questions on that together with my colleague Shayla. Um, and to begin with, this is a paper that you worked on together with uh, Professor Buzema. I I'm not sure if she's on the, on the call, probably he is on the call, probably. Uh, 
And before this publication, there was this argument that hotspots become very visible only in low transmission settings towards the elimination areas, if I understand it correctly. Uh, but the argument TV is made here was that actually you also have, even in the high transmission areas, you also have places that could be considered hotspots and that they play a different role. And a good analogy is the, with the dry and wet season, where in the dry season, as is in the low season, the hotspots such support continuing uh, transmission, but in the wet season, uh, they act as a source of infection. So I guess the question for us therefore is, if you were doing an intervention and you are in a place like Nigeria and we have a number of my colleagues here from Nigeria or in the North of Uganda uh, in very high transmissions, is there a value in still trying to identify the so-called hotspots in such high transmission sites? Uh, I'll, I'll wait. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, the, it does make sense. I'll weigh in with my opinion, and I'm, I'm probably going to stoke controversy here, and I'm going to say no. <laughs> okay. I think there, there's probably a lot of spatial variability and transmission in those settings, but in a place in the, you know, the sort of soggy bottomed valleys where everyone is at risk, there might be differences in risk, maybe even a factor of 10 as you move across these landscapes, depending on your location. And this is taking into account other factors like the quality of the housing. I mean, you're lower risk if you live in a higher, you know, a house with bricks and a tin roof and things like that. But, you know, all else equal, there's a lot of variability. But you don't, I haven't seen places where, you know, the, the risk is so low that you could actually ignore any place, right? So every place is still a source. And, and you're going to have in places like that where the annual EIR is well above 100, mm. you're probably going to have to cover everyone with very high level of coverage to get, uh, get rid of malaria and bring transmission down. And the other point to be made here is that when you do that, it's not just what does transmission look like here and now, but what is transmission going to look like after you've removed the dominant vectors and now you have this this other picture of transmission, let's, let's say you, you know, Malabo is a good example because Anopheles Gambia sensu stricto and Anopheles funestis disappear, leaving Anopheles calusia. So whatever the patterns of calusia were before, they were sort of masked by these other two vectors. Right. Similarly, in, in Uganda, you remove most of the Anopheles Gambia sensu stricto, most of the Anopheles funestis leaving Anopheles arabiensis, which was a minor component of transmission before you started. And now after blanket IRS, you reduce it down and you've got a different problem. Actually, you, you revealed a minor component of the whole problem, but it's now your only problem that you have left. And so I think spending a lot of time to try to figure out where transmission is the most intensive in the high, highly endemic areas is not um, not a primary concern and you're not, I don't think there's going to be a huge amount of, you know, you're not going to get any efficiency out of your system by finding those places and targeting them. I think yeah. just because you have to target everywhere so it's such high levels of coverage. And that's not to say I don't think they exist. I think they probably do exist. It's just that there's no. so much transmission that uh, it'd be probably not much to be gained by targeting them. Thank you, thank you. I mean, that, that, that makes sense. I, you, you participated in this uh, uh, discussion, but I've seen also in uh, separate pieces of work by yourself uh, that this argument is kind of mismatched. So it's nice to have a clarification. Before we proceed for our colleagues on the line, please feel free to ask questions on the chat box. We have, uh, Quite a number of our colleagues who are supporting this process and if there's a question that should be elevated to David uh, it will be elevated to him and he will answer it we will stop at some point uh, and, and get these questions answered as well uh, please keep this active uh, share your questions on the chat box if you really really want to make a point you can let us know and we will invite you in uh, Shella please take it on thanks Fred um, so Dev I, I think I liked um, the explanation you just gave um, and about dealing with low transmission where, where when you have 
when you're left with vectors that like Arabiensis that have different sort of behavior. And I was wondering when these models were being created, these equations were being created, and we were discussing earlier, earlier on with Fred, and the assumption then is that probably these other vectors, the zoophagic vectors, um, exophilic vectors that are in most of the GMS region and in the Southern African region, that probably these sort of vectors were not included or accounted for in the equation. Is this assumption correct? And how would this, if so, then how would these equations change? Uh, I, I think um, the history of this idea, I, I'm not sure about the early history, but there's a, a big book by, I think it's Forsthal, where they essentially produce human blood feeding indices for lots and lots of species. This is in the 1950s. So this has been a part of the thinking about vectorial capacity in R0 for uh, historically going back. I hope I'm answering your question um, well. So it's not, it, it was, at, you know, I think McDonald had it in the back of his head and he certainly discussed it in his 1957 book, but it didn't become a part of the equation until um, there was this paper by Garrett Jones in 1964, one of several, where he talks about the human blood index and he actually puts it into the, essentially argues that it becomes a part of the equations. And there has been a lot of work done by people, including people like Jerry Colleen and Tom Smith, who sort of explored some of the importance of this, uh, you know, zoophily. Um, so it has been a part of the thinking across uh, uh, across time. Uh, I think all of us recognize, when you look at this map, Africa stands out as it being the place in the world with the highest transmission, but certainly not the only one with high transmission. And the reasons we all think is it, um, these are it, it, these vectors that love to blood feed on humans indoors and at night, which creates this ideal condition for transmission. But there are certainly other areas in the world where, where similar conditions uh, do occur, like still around some areas in the tribal areas of around Odisha and uh, some areas of Papua New Guinea where you get very, very high transmission even still today. But they're the same conditions. It's, it's you know, mosquitoes that love to bite humans. So that's going to affect EIR a lot. I think when you go to other areas of the world outside of Africa, I think there are other concerns about the epidemiology that sometimes creep in. So forest malaria is a good example in Cambodia where we look at, you know, most of these vectors aren't feeding on humans most of the time, so they're not particularly anthropophilic, but you still get persistent transmission. And if you look at the conditions <clears throat> where transmission actually seems to be occurring, there it's in forests where, you know, a, a team went into the forest to cut down a tree so they could sell it. And while they're cutting it down, they're, you know, listening and sweaty and ideal, you know, attractive to mosquitoes. And under those conditions, it, there appears to be very, very high transmission, at least episodically, among the people who have taken, have gone into the forest together. Because the attack rates coming back out of the forest are extraordinarily high, uh, the people who have gone in to do forest malaria. So one of the things I would argue about zoophily is we should think about it in a, in a way that, let me put it this way. There are things I like to do, and then there are the things I do. There are the <laughs> zoophily is a preference that gets yeah. expressed in context. And I think in some contexts, you can have a lot of human blood feeding, even by non zoophilic species. It just depends on time and place, uh, availability of other hosts or lack thereof and so on and so forth. So zoophily and zoophagy are very interesting questions. And I don't, I think there is a sort of a general way of characterizing preferences that probably map onto species or populations. But when you actually measure it in some specific context, you could get variability in zoophagy or anthropophagy, right? And, and how much did you blood feed on a human versus an animal? 
is a, a different question than how much you would have preferred given the, a large set of choices. So that distinction, I hope it holds. But it has always been a part of the picture, at least. So do the equations have, Sheila, are you asking whether the equations change as well? Yeah, so I was wondering whether, so if you look to look at the vectorial capacity and you're looking at the specific parameters M and A, so I'm wondering if you are thinking about the zoophilic vectors, then does this influence or change M and A, how we look at it or how we interpret it? Yeah, I, I've been, when, when I have my, my brothers, I don't write A. I write A as the product of F and Q. Um, so I think that this, um, the term A is, obscures the fact that within A, so this was, when McDonald wrote it down, he wasn't paying much attention to that. And that's why, uh, you know, in Garrett Jones' work starting in 1964, which is obviously derived from McDonald's, he does start to talk about the human blood index and its importance for transmission. And implicitly, at least, he's arguing that you can separate that A into these two terms, F and Q, what I call them, you know, they're just letters that stand for something more significant. But those two terms, uh, if you break A into those two terms, then I think that you will find uh, you can assign a different importance to Q than you do to F, right? So F, blood feeding frequency, is also linked to egg laying. So it actually affects one more part of the process than Q, right? So blood feeding overall is gonna appear in this three times. Q, that sort of anthropophily, zoophily axis appears twice. Survival actually appears four times. So, so there's actually, when you rewrite this, I think you get a different picture of vectorial capacity. One that's easier to understand, in my opinion, and one where these effects become clear. Um, and really, you think about math, the point of math is to actually take something that's complicated and make it as simple as possible, but no simpler, All right? And that, um, no, there's no real guidance on that, but that, that's the point of it. And so I, I, would, I would, you know, as much as McDonald's formula has been highly influential, I would argue it's time to, to start writing it in a different way. Because this, this formula, you asked me to explain it earlier. I have a really hard time explaining it to people. And that's one of the reasons I started writing it in a different way, where yeah. you can say, well, it's these two bytes, survival through the EIP and emergence. It's, you know, just re rearranging the terms a bit, it becomes a much easier formula to explain to people. And then that zoophily anthropophily axis becomes transparently staring you in the face, this is a relevant term, right? Thanks. Yeah, I think um, still on the same slide, Dev, and, and thanks for that clarification on Zufeji and MA. Um, so recently, um, a lot of scientists or some scientists are developing repellents or researching on repellents, and everyone wants to know what the effect or the impact of repellents is on malaria transmission. How would you model the impact of, <laughs> of repellents in relation to this specific formula? It's a really Is fantastic. It just, just, yeah, <laughs> does it, do repellents just affect MA? How would you do it? So the, let, let me start back and say that when McDonald or sorry, when Ross wrote down the, the very first mathematical equation he wrote down about anything in malaria in a published form, it wasn't about transmission. It was about um, mosquitoes moving around in space and the, the effects that would have on control. Then, then he wrote down the transmission models and everybody remembers those. Uh, but what's, what's missing from this formula is obviously this role of space in mosquito ecology. And, and that's exactly what you're getting at with the repellent because the mosquitoes are flying away from here and moving to there. And how far they fly is gonna affect a lot of things. Like if they fly away from here, they're not gonna lay eggs here. And, or Dave, you want me to, do you want me to pull up the, your, your revised equation for this? Sure. To just 
because you keep referring a lot to that. I think we have it somewhere down. We were going to ask you about it later, but I could try and bring it back up. Um, I guess it's in one of it's in that slide on the left. Is that is that the one? Yeah. So that's Correct. that's the one. So if you were to think about this vectorial capacity, what what it's missing, right? This is this is the one that I like to write down rather than the other one, right? So the B22 is the story of vectorial capacity that makes sense to me. A mosquito emerges, it has to bite once to get infected, the first S. It has to survive through the incubation period P and and get and then bite somebody else to transmit. So lambda S squared P is that that's what the vectorial capacity is really describing. And if that maps with, with this sort of problem, it maps onto the one B21, and that B21 maps exactly onto McDonald's formula with one McDonald's problematic math fixed. Right. So, so that is exactly mathematically equivalent under the assumptions to McDonald's formula in B21. B22 is a much simpler formula that says, you know, we can understand transmission potential in terms of essentially three quantities, which I think is And, a, and the, the three quantities, just sorry to, to, to drag you on, Shella, if you allow me. The, the three quantities here, just to clarify, it's the mosquito emergence, that's the, the lambda. Uh, can you go ahead? Uh, the so, number of bites a mosquito would take over human blood meals per mosquito over its lifetime. So and S. that's happening twice, and then the the, the survival of the P, right? Yep. Okay. They're, they're in the formulas in the text right above it. If you right. if you want to yep. see how it maps. And... Yep. Okay. But so here's the problem. What's missing from this formula is uh, something about where those bites were given, right? If I if I were in a population. The mosquitoes are not flying across the whole world. They're, they're flying short distances, sometimes longer distances, but mostly short distances. And there, there's a, an area where this formula makes sense, right? So the bites are going to be given within, say, most of them within a kilometer of where they originated. Probably less than that for most of these things. And so when I look at this formula, you know, it doesn't describe a population writ large. It describes a population in one place at one time, probably. I mean, we can think about it in abstract terms as a guiding principle for applying control. But if I were, ever went out and tried to measure this in a population, I would really, really want to know uh, where, you know, you, we talked earlier about hotspots. Are, are these mosquito populations self-organized around uh, aquatic habitats? So they're flying short distances to blood feed, returning to the aquatic habitats to lay eggs and doing that repeatedly and creating these uh, very strongly locally interacting populations that if depleted would sort of take, maybe take a long time to recolonize, right? So that's the, the picture you wanna have in your head. So how do area repellents work? Well, they probably affect vectorial capacity in this area, in a, in a small area. That um, And so that's where it would apply. And, it, and the crazy thing is about this, right? If I, let's say that the, an area repellent was hugely effective in a small space, it would essentially empty one part of the landscape of any mosquitoes, but it only works here. And outside of the radius where that's having an effect, it's probably not changing anything. And so in those other places, vectorial capacity is essentially unchanged, but people are moving around and people are sort of averaging out all of those exposure events over a much larger spatial scale. So now your math works differently in those spatial contexts. And this is where, we, when we talk about spatial heterogeneity, where I fear you know, moving down to the very fine grain phenomena that sometimes vectorial capacity is, is giving you the wrong idea about how something is going to work and how big its effect size will be. So if you put out enough spatial repellents to affect the whole population everywhere, you might get a huge effect. 
But if you just put it out here and now, you'll, you have a very local effect that would be difficult to, to see at an epidemiological level. Does that make sense? Let me go back to another study that you're all probably more familiar with. You remember when um, the bed net trials were happening in Western Africa and uh, they, they measured spatial area effects. So they, they randomized villages to ITN or not ITN. But then as they- This, was a, this is a Bill Holly's work in Western Kenya, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you notice that as you moved across the transect, you actually see difference in houses depending on whether they were at the center of a control village or the center of a, uh, a, a, a treatment and control. <laughs> treatment and control. <laughs> you get this. control means different things. As you move from a place that had ITNs to a place that didn't have ITNs, you saw differences in things like anemia, um, you know, prevalence, number of cases, right? So, and they were smoothly, they, they were kind of transitioning across those boundaries. So what was happening is you were getting local area effects that were affect, you know, reducing transmission here, but not so much there. And they were kind of smoothing out depending on how people spend their time and how mosquitoes were flying around. So I think that, um, that picture is where vectorial capacity needs to go is to understand what are the spatial scales that characterize the dispersion of infectious bites of transmission by mosquitoes and how that fits together with this other bigger picture where you get dispersion of parasites by humans over much larger spatial scales, typically. I hope that, that gets close. It's, it's, a, it's a, a technically it's challenging thing for me. I don't know about Shayla, but I understand. Yeah, yeah I understand. Right my <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, do you wanna, shall we proceed? Yes, let's proceed. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, Dave, we're going to take a, a, first of all, we'd just like to say thank you to uh, my, uh, our colleagues who are on the, on the line, um, uh, actively responding. There's a very active discussion on the chat box. So uh, maybe a quick question to either Amelie or Ellie or Yalin. Uh, if, if there is a question that you guys would like, would like Dave to respond to uh, before we proceed. Uh, any of our colleagues on the line? Uh, either Amelie or Emily or Jalene, is there a question that Dave should respond to? Yes. David, I think that they are, uh, we are allowed to proceed until uh, a later date, a little, little time, so. Here we go. Yeah, Dev, so this is an interesting one, Dev, to you. Um, uh, we have a lot of young scientists on the line and we are all curious. Um, when we have people like you with a lot of experience, we always want to find out how we can learn from you in terms of career growth. So during your career path, um, your scientific career path, who have you had any mentors and how have these mentors helped shape your, your career? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we all rely on uh, help from people in our lives. And um, I've been very, I think, very fortunate to have had a number of uh, fantastic mentors. Um, the, the, a couple that would rise to the top was my original PhD mentor was a guy named Simon Levin. Um, and later, uh, Ellis McKenzie was a, uh, he recently died of lung cancer. One of my, uh, you know, very important mentor in my life. I've also had a lot of colleagues and uh, who I, I've sort of learned a lot from. Each mentor has its own, has his or her own style. And, um, I think as a, as a student, what's important is to recognize that none of your mentors are perfect and you shouldn't look at them as infallible heroes, but they're, you know, people, everyone in life has strengths and weaknesses. So for example, in Simon Levin's lab, I got an amazing exposure to a large number of brilliant scientists moving through in this crackling environment. But it was also highly competitive, which 
um, you know, in ways that were not necessarily always good, at least for me. And um, Simon was very, uh, very, on the other hand, very supportive. So despite having this sort of locally very competitive thing, he was very supportive. Anything I wanted to do, he was just, he was always willing to support it. And so it was a, a fantastic opportunity to learn and be a scientist uh, because there were so many um, opportunities to learn and grow. Um, being around Ellis McKenzie, it was his patience <laughs> and long suffering and his, his basic, his love and enthusiasm for various parts of malaria that, that sort of infected me with this, um, you know, you have a right to just have pure joy when you're studying things, right? Yeah. That's, that's a part of this that we should never, ever lose, just how much, how, how beautiful the whole thing is. Um, I mean, ugly on human health, but conceptually, it, it's, a, it's exciting to, to grapple with these ideas. And I think that's one of the things that I got from Ellis and also sort of the, the wisdom of dealing with the, the problems. So I think you have a mentor for a couple of reasons. One of them is to stimulate you intellectually, right? And, and guide you through the process. But there's also this, they're big career decisions that mentors are there to help you uh, navigate. And um, then there are these other life traits, work-life balance, which is something I think all of us need to sort of carefully uh, consider because burnout, especially in the era of COVID has been a very real thing for many of us. I've certainly felt it. And, um, you know, partly we look to our mentors to give us guidance and advice about, you know, where to look for a job, what's worth focusing on more than other things, um, and then just general support. So yes, I've had a number of useful mentors, but they were not always my formal mentors. They were people who, you know, were around me who I learned a lot from, including younger people. Like uh, there's this guy, Fredros, who I learned a lot from. And, uh, you know, many of the colleagues on the line, you know, listen to them and watch them very carefully. You learn things from me like, oh, I, you know, that's something I should be doing more of. And so I learn a lot from, I, I try to learn a lot from everyone around me. Um, I think the most important thing for a mentor to provide though is resources so that you have the freedom to do your work and to develop intellectually. So you want a, a mentor, if you can get one, who's going to give you a direction but also give you a little freedom. Freedom to explore your own ideas so that you can become the, you know, a self-guided uh, researcher, if that's your goal in life. Now, I'm, I'm talking now as if everyone's gonna become a PI and that's obviously not true. Many people don't want to become principal investigators. And so I think, you know, if you, if you wanna be a PI, you need to find somebody who's gonna give you a chance to make your own mark in the world, to, to give you time and space to do that. Um, uh, and I'm gonna say a few things that are obvious. Stay away from toxic individuals if you can. The toxic individuals, uh, you know, even in the short, sometimes in the short term, it seems like a great idea to start working with someone who's um, got a bad reputation or whatever. You can find out later down the line that that might come back to bite you in various ways. So try to stay away from people who are not, you know, really caring about you as an individual um, and your, your, your development. People who are trying to use you as, as cheap labor are probably not the best mentor for you. So those are my sort of key bits of advice here. Yeah, thank you, uh, David. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot, David. We, we will uh, um, go back to a, a little bit of the technical detail. Uh, and uh, to my colleagues in the line, uh, we hope that you're able to stay uh, longer. This masterclass has run for a very long time and we know that some people are not able to stay for more than an hour or so. Uh, uh, but those who are still able to stay with us, uh, please stay tuned. We, st we still have a lot of discussion ahead. David, we were discussing earlier about hotspots and 
there has been an argument previously made that if you just target these hotspots, you can have quite a big volume in terms of disease, uh, uh, in terms of re reduction of disease burden. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in 2019, you guys uh, published these simulations uh, uh, fitted with data from three different sites in Uganda, from Jinja, Kanungu, and Tororo, uh, selected to match uh, three different uh, transmission intensities, one very low, one moderate, uh, and one uh, considerably high. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked at the, uh, the, 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 the simulations and the findings that you had, and maybe we didn't get it correctly, but it appears you are saying that uh, at, the, at the bottom here, you see that a lot of that uh, effect is contributed by the environment uh, much more than the, the characteristics of the super spreaders themselves or, or the individual households. So. And, and you, you, you then conclude kind of that even if you were to target these so-called hotspots, that you wouldn't necessarily achieve, achieve as big a gain as expected. So the question here to you is how does that match with the original Pareto principle, with the original 80-20 rule? Is, there, is this a change or is it something that is only observable in this Uganda situation? Fantastic question, and uh, again, we're going to get into some some kind of territory that I find uh, isn't wholly resolved in my own brain. So, uh, the first thing is to say, science, even published articles after peer review, should always be regarded as a work in progress, and uh, this applies backwards in time to my own work. So, my first conception of this problem was to think about heterogeneous fighting as a, a frailty term. That is to say, I was um, more likely to be bitten than somebody else. So super spreading was mostly due to super spreaders. So these were people who were living in a particularly high transmission setting and so on and so forth. When we did this analysis, uh, it did not seem to be that we could find a lot of that. And especially at high transmission settings in like in Tororo, which is this, you know, when we talk about flat bottom valleys, that this yeah. is a place with a lot more yeah. I'm hearing somebody talking in the background. Um, yeah. just transmission becomes more even at high transmission intensity if you measure it by the coefficient of variation. So the variance divided by the mean. So this is, um, at low transmission intensity, it appears that things are more heterogeneous yeah. when you look at these measures of dispersion. And this is consistent, I think, with some other things where we would say, even though there are big differences in transmission at high intensity, essentially everyone is getting exposed at a pretty high rate. And the people who are getting exposed at a high rate today may be different than the ones that get exposed next week or the week afterwards. That, that's the position I've come around to is to say that the heterogeneous biting, you know, there is a frailty term. Some people are more bitten more often than others. And that's what you're looking at. So this was a statistical analysis of uh, these households over time. And what you were seeing is that there were differences among households in how much they were being bitten. So you can see you know, the mean of this is anchored to one. A lot, a lot of households were below the mean. And a few of them were much, you know, being bitten the rate that was much higher than the mean. So when you see eight, that one green dot at eight, that means that it was being bitten at eight times the rate of the houses around it. And this mm -hmm. sort of, I'm looking at the lower left of the figure on the screen right now with those green, red, and blue dots. And for those who are colorblind, I apologize. We're, we're getting better at doing colorblind friendly colors as we... Uh -oh. I'm just I'm just trying to to to, to point at the exact figures. It's, it's, you mean the lower left or that is the one I mean? So okay. so there are for differences in frailty, but they don't account for most of the heterogeneity and biting you're seeing. So the, but another big source in these data, and you can see it in the one in the figure just above it, is the seasonal signal. So there was yep. a huge seasonal signal in who was being bitten uh, when. And then there was this residual noise or residual heterogeneity, which was something we couldn't explain by either one of those figures. And so we 
call that environmental heterogeneity. What it means is everything else. And, and lumped into that, it should be noted, is all of the sampling errors and everything else that we can't, we didn't have a good handle on how to estimate them. And we did our best, but we probably didn't do a great job of getting a handle on what those errors look like. But, but really, if you think about it, there are big differences in what you do, um, you know, depending on wind and... Yeah. A shout out to Janet Medega online for a sort of lovely publication on that. But you know, wind and and human activity patterns that differ that are going to lead to huge differences in uh, who gets exposed when, and those can change over time dynamically. So I think uh, my view is changing away from a sort of a frailty measure to a a noise, a stochastic noise in the system being quite enormous. So, that being so in said, terms of Low transmission settings, this yeah. focal idea probably still is a relevant one. Right. And, and that's where, you know, there is probably a lot of important research to be on locating those. But otherwise, I think in, at these high transmission settings, my view is, has evolved to, now to, to the point where yeah. I would argue you just want to try to get the highest level of coverage you can in these settings. So, so th this ties very well with the question we asked earlier when we were referring to the paper you guys published with Tun Bozema. Uh, in this specific case of Uganda, you're still showing that places with low transmission, such as ginger, the uh, what you'd call the Pareto uh, uh, index, uh, you're still getting like 80, 20, 90, 10 in some cases, uh, a very small proportion, very small community contributing most of the elimination. But in high transmission areas, you see that this is not so. It's, it could even be 50-50, sometimes 60-40. You are saying, therefore, that if you are NMCP director in Uganda, for example, in the high transmission zones, there is no need for targeting. But in the low transmission, there's need for targeting. Is that, is that what you're saying? That is what I, I'm saying. And I would add one other thing to that. So in let, let's... Drill down on the case of Jinja. Right. Uh, which is, so this particular subdistrict in Jinja was actually in the downtown area. It's fairly fairly built up, and you know it's not a place where people are staying put. So people from this area of Jinja are probably getting exposed in the surrounding areas and probably traveling to the country and getting exposed. So so it's important to remember local transmission in Jinja might be highly focal. And in this case, actually, if you look at the analysis, the people were getting exposed at the highest rates were the ones who were living at the edge of town. So it's the right. opposite of local. <laughs> it's like there's a sink where there's no transmission or very little transmission city. But remember, that's not a situation in isolation with the humans. So on the mosquito side, probably, yes. On the human side, people are traveling long distances. So it, in, yeah. in places where you have low focal transmission, the, the two things matter a lot. Where are the mosquitoes breeding locally, but also how much is uh, exposure is happening with people traveling out into the surrounding countryside, getting exposed and bringing malaria back to sustain transmission here. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for, for that clarification. Uh, what, one, one last point on this is um, you once did some work with uh, um, uh, your colleagues at UCSF, you were mentioning this earlier. And here you are talking about people rather than places. And so this idea of hot populations, uh, let me see if I have, we have the slide here. Um, uh, could you describe very, very briefly before we proceed, this idea of you know, hot pops versus hot spots? Uh, because sometimes you know, it's not a location, it's a group of people who are, for some reason, uh, at high risk. Yeah, I, I, um, I think this gets into the, the very important business of trying to stratify populations by risk, whether right. it's location or activity. Um, and some people, uh, you know, especially in, in, in the Mekong Delta, generally that there's a lot of transmission that occurs outdoors when people are, you know, in the forest for various reasons. And those activities are stratified both culturally and economically. So people are, who are going into the forest um, to cut down trees, for example, that's the quintessential. This is one of many kinds of examples. Those are, those are people who are uh, 
putting themselves at risk in a particular time and space in a particular time and way. They're moving into a high risk place and participating in transmission differently than most of the rest of the population. And so that when we talk about Malabo, it's much simpler. You know, it turns out that one in Malabo, some of the people who were most high risk were the government workers who were required to travel from this island to the mainland where there isn't any control. And so, you know, government workers were a much higher worker of getting infected while they traveled. Yeah. So, you know, stratification of exposure risk locally, spatially is a very important thing, but it can't be subdivided from the other activities that put you at risk away from, you know, the area where you focus, you decided you're going to study malaria here, but there are things happening outside of the area that you set up for your study. And that can't be ignored. And in fact, the smaller the area, the more it can't be ignored. Uh, and it's, it's so, you know, that, that's what I would argue is, is a very important take home message from this kind of thing. Thank Especially you. in low transmission settings. Thank you. Uh, Sheila Bakshi. Thanks, Fred. Um, yeah, so um, when thinking about RC and um, the different elimination or control phases that malaria programs are in, what does an RC of less than 0 0.5 really mean? And when you're thinking about both epidemiological parameters and entomological um, parameters, how, does this, how do these parameters change when you're thinking about RC? So let me take it on, on entomologically, it's gonna be very hard to measure uh, transmission. So you can probably measure something like a human biting rate, but, and that would be informative, but you're probably not gonna get a good estimate of EIR. And so uh, on that side of things, I would say entomological surveillance is probably not gonna be hugely uh, useful. The other thing is to say an you know, average value of RCO. Yeah, yeah. David, can you repeat what she just said? <laughs> <laughs> that's a very dangerous statement to, to, to make on this masterclass. Well, I'm happy to take the heat, but I, I felt for a long time that, that um, entomological surveillance in low transmission settings is, um, it, you can't measure EIR, or well, you could try, but you're, you know, if you're gonna be honest about your statistics, it's not gonna be very informative. Remember that HBR is easy to, much easier to, to measure than, than EIR, though. No, so you can still do HBR. If you're willing to sort of take the point of view that you're interested in mosquitoes, whether or not you find any spores like positive ones, then, then I think you can get useful measures. But you're just, you know, the chances of finding a spores like positive mosquito are um, pretty low. But remember, for other diseases, we do entomological surveillance all the time. And we never, we rarely find, you know, dengue positive mosquitoes, and that's okay. People are, are content with that. It's still a meaningful measure. It's just not EIR. Um, and I think the questions at the low intensity are different as well. You, you really care about outdoor feeding mosquitoes probably a lot more in those settings. So you need to make sure that you're doing your entomological surveillance in the right way to count the mosquitoes that are really sustaining transmission. But let me, let me take it the other way and say there's probably, there's another way of measuring it. And that is if you, you know, by the time you get to very, very low transmission, if you didn't have any imported malaria, it would just go away. So what happens in these low transmission settings is, is that it doesn't go away. But what you have is very little local transmission, but you have still a lot of imported malaria cases. And that ratio of imported to local malaria cases becomes highly informative about the amount of local transmission that's going on. And there are some you know, new methods that probably should and could be developed. And I've got a lot of colleagues who are doing fantastic work, but the, the notion is just that if you take that ratio and try to map it out spatially, it ought to tell you where there are residual hotspots. So if you find like, so the Eswatini is a really great example. That was a, a place that they've done a fantastic job of controlling malaria transmission if you look at where all the cases are occurring, most of the cases are occurring in the cities. That's where most of the people live. But there are very few second, you know, cases of malaria in the cities that aren't associated with travel. And if you go 
outside of the cities, then you find a much larger fraction of cases that are associated with, are not associated with travel. And probably with people are moving across into Mozambique and getting infected there, or you know, even errant mosquitoes flying across. But there's probably a lot of spatial variability in those quantities. Uh, and so RC of less than five on average is probably, you know, going back to our hotspots discussion, not everywhere equally low. Probably a lot of places almost zero, and then a few places where there's still some residual high level of risk. And so um, this, this ratio of imported to local cases and spatial variability in that ratio is probably what you want to do in low transmission settings. Now, I wanted to come back to this. Shayla raised something earlier about um, this notion that you have a kind of a stable environment that gets disrupted by uh, control measures. You know, we take that as a kind of a background thing, but in place, in a lot of places in the world, that's not an accurate description of the way malaria transmission happens. The way malaria transmission happens is you have this kind of low level mosquito population that's hanging out until there's a weather event and then you get a booming mosquito population for a short period of time and a malaria outbreak. And these outbreak prone areas, I think are something that, you know, if we can identify where the outbreak prone areas, we ought to treat them differently when we think about control. And um, so I think, you know, that's the other side of this is you could have a place that sort of malaria is not a big problem this year or next year, but in five years, if the right conditions come along, you have a massive outbreak and you have a huge problem. Right, so thinking about all of these conditions and what we actually mean by RC is it's pretty critical to not let the math, you know, don't let the, the tail wag the dog here, right? The math is there to inform us. It's not reality. And, and we sort of need to be very conscious about reality um, being different than what the assumptions we make in our models and where, where those differences arise. Yeah, so essentially, Dev, you can have, um, you can be in elimination, but with very high or with relatively high mosquito densities, in which case you'd be looking at um, entomological indicators. But when you have elimination, uh, when you are in elimination and probably you have very low mosquito densities and um, low importation cases, and then maybe ENTO indicators are not useful. I'm still not very clear on when ENTO indicators would be less, less important when measuring this. Let, let, me, let me revise my, my former statement so that I'm very clear. I think measuring HBR, the human biting rate, or mosquito densities can be incredibly informative in these low transmission settings at finding out where hotspots might be and in fact, I don't think you're gonna be able to get at where transmission is still occurring in these low transmission settings just by taking parasitological measures. Because it's uh, risk ends up being so diffuse across the human population that you can't, probably can't do it. Um, you can't identify the sources of transmission using other indices other than mosquitoes. Uh, I would just argue that we should not put this premium on EIR because sporozoites are going to be very difficult to find. Um, but, but measuring variability in mosquito density across these spatial scales might be exactly the thing you need to do to mop up the last pockets of transmission. And so I think where we're not very good though is on devising sampling schemes that um, and study designs that help us drill down on where these last focal pockets of mosquito populations exist. So if the mosquito populations are highly focal and you can identify them, then you could probably, you know, remove the last pockets of local transmission. You'd still have an importation problem, but the onwards transmission locally is not essentially a big problem. So, so HBR, I think, ends up being a very useful way of doing that in these local settings, but with the, with the purpose, I mean, you, I don't think there's any metric that you can say, well, this is what I always want to measure. What you want to measure really depends on what you're trying to do. And I think countries need to come to grips with this for their entomological surveillance at a, at a, a country scale. 
And study designs need to come at it from a different point of view. And at different points in the process of eliminating malaria, you might have different needs to use different metrics. You know, depending on what it is, you know, what's the salient policy question that's, that's staring you in the face? Is it how to mop up the last pockets of transmission or control imported malaria or reduce uh, biting by outdoor mosquitoes or whatever it is that happens to be your problem at this time and place or insecticide resistance. We haven't talked about that at all. You know, those are all sort of key concerns. And um, so your surveillance should be helping you to identify the problems and solutions, right? The, the, the information you gather should be directly informing the policies you need to make. So we, we had a, a, a class, a fantastic class with uh, uh, Professor Barcott, uh, <laughs> Tom Barcott and uh, Tanya Russell. Uh, recently, and I remember Tom, um, and actually for our colleagues on the line as well, this might be a nice session to refer back to, <coughs> because I remember Tom, <coughs> excuse me, Tom emphasizing the idea that in, in, in using examples from, <coughs> excuse me, using examples from um, uh, the Pacific, in some places where uh, the, the interesting thing there is just to look at mosquito densities because it's a, it becomes a question of receptivity rather. It becomes a very, very low transmission. It's still important to do entomology, but um, the only thing that you can measure then is, is, uh, is, is, is mosquito numbers. So I guess Dave, for, for, for the benefit of Shell and myself and my colleagues here, a clarification for you to make here is whether this is something we can also directly just apply in the African context. Um, to just go for, in these low transmission settings, just go for human biting rates instead of uh, uh, trying to measure EIR. Um, as a general answer, I would hesitate to say anything. Okay. I, I, think, <laughs> I think most of the variability in the EIR yes. that you measure is variability in the HBR. So I okay. think it's a much more informative measure. And, and when, I, and when we look at the decisions that you want to make in the field, I think that there's sometimes more, this is the point, I think Fredros, I've seen publications with your name on it, where are the mosquitoes resting, which can yep. change locally, right? So you want to enhance contact between mosquito populations and insecticides. And if you're spraying right. the wrong surface, then you're going to be missing the mosquitoes resting. So maybe you don't need to count mosquitoes, but you need to measure resting behavior. Right. And if, if you go out to measure HBR naively, let's say you put a, a trap in a house, but all of the biting is occurring out of doors, then you're gonna be missing that part of it, right? The, so because mosquitoes, and we have so much variability in the vector populations that transmit malaria, I would argue HBR is probably the most important thing to know. And secondarily, sporozoite a white rate to give you EIR, but HBR is far more important. Where and when are people being bitten by mosquitoes? And then what are, where and when are they missing? Are there gaps in the in mosquito contact with the interventions that you have? So where, where and when are you missing the mosquito populations with your control measures? Are the, seem to me to be the salient points. And those are not vectorial capacity related issues by and large. Thank you. Right, and Thank HBR you. is broadly informative about that, but it's not, it's hard to map it directly on. On the other hand, right, if you're not, if you're doing spraying and you're not knocking down your mosquito populations, then something is not working. Is it resistance or is it a mosquito behavior or factory behavior? Is it just that you mismatch your operations in the mosquito populations, right? Those are the kinds of questions that I think entomological surveillance should be focused on, not just measuring transmission intensity. Although I'm, I'm very, I think it's important to know that, but it's one of many things that's very important to know. Thank you. Shana, do you have any additional questions? No, no. No. There is on. a petition on, online. There is a, I think we are missing out here. There's there's quite an active conversation going on on the chat box. And there's a little petition there to have uh, uh, Professor Charlwood uh, uh, um, uh, take on, um, ask 
a question or respond to some question about low transmission. So Derek, if, if you're on the line and would like to make a comment on this, please, please feel welcome. <clears throat> hello. Hello, Derek. Ah, hello, hello. Uh, thanks for a very good, very interesting um, session today. I've enjoyed it immensely. And uh, yeah, my, my question was basically something that, that, that Dave has been talking about, and that is what should the entomologist sample um, as you approach elimination? If you, if you want, in many models, let's say, you're looking at an average exposure, uh, whatever that means, but so you might sample, if you're sampling in a village, you might choose random households to sample from. But as you approach elimination, you, uh, uh, and if you're putting in a, a, an effective control and you're wanting to, to monitor to see whether or not that control is working or not, getting an average response is not actually what you want. You want to get uh, the, the most sensitive measure I believe, so that you would want to go to the high density households or areas in order to, to see that your control is still working. That basically, were, I mean, I just wanted to know if, if Dave agreed with, with what, I, what I think anyway. Well, he said, I agree. Go ahead, Dave. I, I would even take it one step further and say, that in those low transmission settings, that trying to get EIR because it has some hypo theoretical value as a measure of exposure can make you waste a lot of time. You don't, if, you, if your concern is about how well is my program working overall, you want the most sensitive measure you can to catch the most mosquitoes to get an indication of what's going on so you can respond to it. You know, having a, a sample that's sort of in some research, uh, applying some research standard to say, I, I care about catching a representative sample of exposure in this population, is, is I think wrong-minded. It's, it, you, your concerns have now shifted and especially if you're concerned about informing a policy, from measuring exposure to finding the information you need to take the next step towards elimination or warning you about when things have changed so you can respond accordingly. And all of that is best served by having the most sensitive measure of transmission or mosquito populations that you can get, not by having one that's an accurate measure of exposure. Yeah. So I agree with you, Eric. Yeah, I, 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 We've never had a chance to uh, meet. <laughs> Well, Derek, Derek, you want to go on video a little can, bit so, so, can so we, we, can, we can make a uh, connection here? Can, yeah, can, can I make one more comment before I yeah. mute myself? Um, and that is that, that estimates of, of biting rates, let's say, or exposure are, uh, yes, are, are, as we know, fraught with, with difficulty. But very often what you're wanting is a, a relative measure so that you might be comparing, you know, a control versus an intervention area, so that it doesn't really matter whether or not if you catch a hundred mosquitoes, that means a person is being bitten by a hundred mosquitoes. It means that in this area, the mosquito population is a hundred, and over the other area, it may be ten. Um, as long as you're using the same method in order to um, estimate density, uh, so. I'm, I'm not too worried about getting an absolute estimate of, of exposure in order to estimate EIR. I agree. I've stopped. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, All right. I, and I, the only thing I would add, and, and Derek probably can say this more, is that the comparisons you want to make are over time. That you can't, whatever sampling method you choose and whatever locations you sample, it's very difficult to even say that your estimate of one species is comparable to your estimate of another species. So what you're looking at is in a place over time, useful measures of progress towards elimination or warnings of outbreaks, rather than saying, I have an accurate measure of exposure. 
I just I think in low transmission settings, especially, we just give up on that, and that's okay. Thank you. you. Know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I think we're going to move forward, and I would <coughs> I would like us to uh, um, uh, move to the subject of tra travel, uh, which has come up quite a lot as well, uh, and. Uh, uh, Shell and myself have a number of uh, maybe three or four questions around travel, and we're going to touch on the issue of Zanzibar as well, because several times we are asked about this. To begin with, Dave, uh, this is work that you did uh, together with your colleagues at, uh, uh, in Kenya. And uh, uh, in the beginning, you guys were just using mobile phone data to track uh, what you refer to in this case as sources and sinks of uh, um, of malaria infections. Uh, and there is a, a different piece of work here that you've, you've also done cross-continental, um, finding there are very clear differences, for example, between West African settings. Uh, 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 and I guess some of this reflect the high and low transmission settings that, that we had earlier. Now, the, the questions we have here, just for clarification, later you have done work uh, with our Chai colleagues uh, looking at Zanzibar and uh, travel risk and malaria importation in Zanzibar. And one particular thing that comes out of this work is the idea that, yes, we can blame travelers, but actually the people who carry most of the infection are the local residents who travel abroad and come back. Now, I guess an explanation that would be important for us here is what really makes this difference that you have local travelers going abroad, bringing in most of the infections, much more infection than travelers who come into Zanzibar. What, what, what are the unique features about, about these settings uh, that do that? And, and actually, how would you deal with that if you are the malaria control person um, taking care of a situation such as Zanzibar? And I imagine that this is something that is happening also in other uh, small island nations. Thanks. It's a, it's a... Another one of these, you know, I wish malaria was simple in some way, right? It's not. At every place that you move into the world, there's, there's something really complicated uh, part of the problem. And it's importation and travel and its relationship to endemic malaria is, is no exception. So um, let me start by saying that in the previous slide, that we were using different data sources to describe travel. So it, it, when we were looking at travel among countries in the Tatum and Smith uh, PNAS paper, we were yeah. using uh, migration data. So people who live here now who reported that they're, they had moved here from another country. So this is looking at the interrelated migration patterns at the, at the bottom right. Yeah. The, the top one, the Wesolowski et al. paper that was anchored by Carolyn Bucky, this paper is looking at <clears throat> a mobile phone data set that um, describes mobile phone users. And you can see the locations of the mobile phone towers, which only covers, I want to make very clear, only covers about 50% of maybe or 60% of the African, of the, uh, the area, the population, that is 50% of where populations live. Because there's a lot of rural, um, there are a lot of rural populations that don't have a mobile phone tower nearby. So we miss that. And of course we know that mo a lot more transmission occurs in rural settings in most of Africa than in urban settings. So, you know, what we're seeing here is a modeled relationship using mobile phone data and there have been studies in the, in the Zanzibar context where we also use mobile phone data. And what we're trying to do here is to get a sense of how people are moving parasites around by looking at how people are moving around. And it's, it's missing this important layer about micro scale risk and humans uh, where they're actually spending time at risk and who's getting exposed and who's not. So um, this is a, these are sort of model relationships at these spatial scales to try and understand the importance of imported malaria. Now, if we can go back to Zanzibar, I wanna make some points about this that are 
um, I think, highly relevant. So if you were to look at Zanzibar, uh, and I think the bottom part is where it's most useful, the urban districts in Nguja, where Stonetown is found, uh, has a lot of people. Most of the people are living in these urban areas or surrounding it in West. Uh, it it's, doesn't have much malaria transmission anymore. Um, and prevalence, you know, in, in thousands of people sampled, you find almost no parasites. So when you do find malaria transmission in Zanzibar, it is probably some combination of people who live here having gone abroad, got exposed and brought it home, and then they happen to live in an area where there's a pocket of local mosquitoes that's transmitting, and you get, you know, local transmission. Now, just because the mosquitoes are here doesn't mean that only people here get exposed. So there's within Anguja travel, which is very hard to get with mobile phones, right? You have to get some other data source that, you know, there have been some other great studies where you put these GPS trip loggers on people and you find out where they are at every moment of the day to get a cloud of points describing their behavior. And so all of these things together are trying to, you have to cobble these together and trying to get a picture of local transmission. Now, in general, we understand how these processes work. In specific instances, it becomes both hugely important and very difficult to study. So the particular details probably matter a lot. So this is a, a Muslim country where there's a lot of polygamy and some of these fishermen actually have families on both sides of that water, of that, of that strait. Moving from one family, uh, one household to another. So fishermen have been proposed as one very important um, group of people that's carrying transmission back and forth or carrying parasites back and forth from the mainland. Could be. Could be that there are, uh, there's another group of people who's leaving uh, and going away to work somewhere in Tanzania at a hotel where they have an uncle who's given them a job and they have a night security job and they're getting exposed and then they come home and you know bring malaria back. The reason we believe it's people living here and going away and coming home that are contributing to transmission more is that they spend more of their time infectious here, right? People who are coming through are spending a short time and you know they're, they're spending their time in particular times and places, right? So you have, you're either visiting family, which is probably means that your level of risk is typical for the area or you're, you're a tourist. And if you're a tourist, you're probably in Stonetown or at a hotel that does a lot of mosquito control because tourists don't like mosquitoes. So they, you know, they'll spend a lot of money controlling mosquitoes. So, so that's why, you know, it's, it's this stratification again. Who, who exactly is it who's traveling and putting themselves at risk and coming home? And then where are the local pockets of transmission? That, that you know, for Zanzibar right now, I think that's the key set of questions. Um, and, you know, I, I, I really find it is probably, you can never in these low transmission settings, never think of just the mosquitoes or just the travel. It, it's some combination of both of these things and yeah. very, very hard to, to sort of say general things about because it's probably, you know, little things. I mean, if I were to take it out of the malaria context and say, okay, the original SARS epidemic, not SARS, Two that we're in now, but SARS-1. Does anyone remember that it was a school group in Toronto that went to, had gone to Taiwan and brought all of these cases home? It was this peculiar set of circumstances that caused the outbreak in Toronto. And at the beginning of epidemics and for all these, you know, processes that we're talking about, it, it's very stochastic and probably idiosyncratic. And the idiosyncrasies are really hard to deal with as a general science problem. But you know, as a management problem, you have to deal with the idiosyncrasies. So it's it's the shoe leather epidemiology and the muddy boot entomology that are probably going to give you the information you really need to take the last steps in these settings. So we can do great, brilliant studies and publish them, right? But um, but we can't actually necessarily identify the, the really salient bits of information on the ground, and that I think has to come down to contextual surveillance, contextually designed surveillance. It's looking for the, you know, what are the most important questions here and now? Thank you. Yeah. 
Sheila, did, did you have any additional questions on the Zanzibar thing? No, no. Okay. Uh, Dave, the, the point that you raised last, uh, uh, I had a, a conversation with uh, uh, Professor Andrew Giveco from Western Kenya earlier. And uh, I, I think I actually saw him on video. I don't know if he's still around. Uh, and one question, uh, Professor Andrew, if, if you're still around, it would be nice to, to, to have this conversation right now. Of how much focus should we put on data collection vis-a-vis -vis the focus that we put on mathematical modeling? Uh, and and you, you were talking about, you know, we can do these nice studies, but it really boils down to the people. So um, the, the question that was coming from Andrew, and I, I really do hope that Andrew is still on the call. If, 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 if he is, then he could, he could take this on directly. But and we can discuss this just a little later, but how much focus should we put on data collection or collection of high quality data uh, on the ground? Uh, this would be improving capabilities to do this uh, cool mathematical models. So you don't have to respond that now. Uh, let's let's wait and see if Andrew is there because I, I really wanted him to to take this himself. Uh, Sheila says that we can we can proceed, and I think we're going to take the last bit of this, which is a question we're sending back to to Dave. Can you still hear me, Dave? I can still hear you. I think Gatheko has gone off. I can't see him in the chat list when I tried to chat him. Oh, okay. It's a shame it has, because I hear his voice. Yes, yes. He, he, he was very keen to, to ask to ask this. Uh, we, we have been discussing earlier a lot about uh, trying to be absolute versus trying to be relative. And you spent, you know, in recent years focused a lot on, you know, making these vectorial capacity questions practical. No, and here is an example of the work that you've done with Oliver Brody. Uh, and, and the idea here was how do we convert the, or, the original um, the version of this equation into something that people can measure. And I would, I would like to request that, you know, you walk us briefly through this and also just explaining this of how then can an NMCP use this to make progress because at, at some stage earlier you were also mentioning that you know what you want to be able to measure something in the beginning and then measure it at the end and see how much change you made uh, and this is very different than just going out there to estimate how much is uh, what is your material capacity so uh, we, we have a one or two slides for this and if you could just if you don't mind you could begin by that and just you know walk us through the exact transformations that you've done to the vectorial capacity question so that it's more practically useful. So I think the first thing to say is that when McDonald wrote down these equations, he didn't bother to explain the underlying math very well. Right. He sort of derived them. And in fact, you can't you look through his formulas for derivations uh, and you won't find them. He presented them as sort of what could have been done. So in, in 2004, you know, I decided it was probably worth writing a paper that describes the underlying mathematics. So the main thing is that there's, there's a survival process in the mosquitoes. And in the models that McDonald wrote down, uh, he, he makes an assumption that the lifespan is exponentially distributed. So we steering clear of the senescence question for a moment. Let's just stick with the math. And the other, the other part of the process is that as mosquitoes bite, they become infected. So there's an in, infective process that's increasing. And if you take the product of these two, you get the proportion of mosquitoes that's both alive and infected, well, infected first. And that's what the blue curves are showing you. And the, the red curves are showing you what happens many days later after some of them have lived long enough to become infective, infective, right? So blue is infected and red is infective. And you see that 10 days later, in this case, it's what do you say, 12 days later, 14 days later, a large fraction of the mosquitoes um, that, you know, are alive and inf infective is it's much smaller than the fraction of that are alive and infected, right? So the dark blue and the dark red are an illustration of what McDonald said, 
would happen in the equations. And then this sort of, if you kill mosquitoes fast, you get the light blue and the right red. And, and what the, the area under the curve is telling you essentially that measure of vectorial capacity that you care about per mosquito, per adult mosquito. So the, the dark red you can see is smaller than the dark blue, but when you actually increase mortality a lot, the proportion, the, the proportional reduction in dark blue versus light blue is much smaller than the proportional reduction in dark red versus light red. So it's, this is an illustration of a McDonald put in a table, but this is just showing you in picture form. So essentially, if you can kill mosquitoes faster, you, you have a much larger effect on transmission by adult mosquitoes than you know, as a single measure. So what's the value of this for a control program, I think, is, is understanding. Right, you're trying to understand why that's true. And in a nutshell, I think this has become um, codified into a simple bit of advice. The first thing you do, try to kill the mosquitoes. And, and the benefits of killing mosquitoes go beyond those two effects because there's also a, um, you're reducing the density of mosquitoes overall and you're also reducing the number of eggs laid by female mosquitoes over their lifetime. So, you know, McDonald didn't get everything in that formula. He was focusing only on the sporozoite rate when he wrote that down. The only other thing I would say here, though, is if you look at, um, so this is where you try to apply it, and you're saying, well, okay, if I focus on that formula, you might miss the fact that you have more than one vector, vector species present in the area, and each one of those is responding differently to control. So if I, if, you know, this is the classical problem of removing a dominant vector and revealing a, a yeah. minor vector whose effect on transmission was being masked by the dominant vector. And so when you, when you look at the, you know, vectorial capacity overall is a, is a simple sum across species. And if I remove one species, I'm left with the other, right? And, and now instead of all of the sensitivity analysis I did for one species apply to one species, but if I get differential effects, either on a type that's insecticide resistant or a type that's you know, responding differently to control, then my formulas behave differently and my sensitivity analyses don't necessarily apply. And this is where in response to Gatheco's uh, question from earlier that we missed, where we would argue that it's not one or the other but it has to be an interaction between the two, right? So you do your analytics to identify the thing that you need to measure and then you measure it and then you go back out and, I, and, and there's this iterative process ideally that kicks in where you're, you're, you're using the data and the analysis probably with some mathematical models involved yeah. to identify you know, where you are and how things have changed since the last time you looked and you're adjusting your, your surveillance schemes. And I think that's best done as a conversation between people who do math and people who get their feet muddy because neither one can give you the, you know, the only answer that's, that, that you need, right? It's, it's learning about your system as you change it. Remember, that's what we're doing. We're changing a system when we do vector control. So everything we learned about it before uh, probably applies if we take control away but now I'm dealing with a different set of problems that have been revealed because I was successful, right? And that's kind yeah. of the way you want to think about these formulas and how they can apply in different contexts. They're not right. always universally applicable. Yeah, Dave, another, another point that I see here, and I'm not sure if, 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 uh, if this is uh, correct, um, this is a, a fairly technical um, uh, subject for us, is in the original equations uh, by, um, uh, Rose and McDonald's, the vectorial capacity was really not designed to capture specific interventions, if you wanted, that had specific characteristics. The modification that you have here with the G, for example, in there, uh, um, could we assume that, could we say that this is like the part of it that then allows you to introduce things such as level source management? Yeah, I mean, for example, McDonald's formulas are virtually silent on the topic of larval source management. I, in fact, I mean, he makes kind of arguments that, that, um, that things ought to be more sensitive to killing adult mosquitoes 
than to larval control. But you look at the history of malaria before then and, and the vector control before then, and some of the greatest successes in the whole history of the world had been up to that point had been larval source management. You know, getting rid of Anopheles arabiensis from northern Brazil, probably arabiensis from Brazil, with SOPRA was all larval source management. And some of the other, the, the I'm, gonna, I'm gonna forget my natural history, but you know, there, a lot of this was done through larval source management. But it's also true that larval source management, the effects were highly heterogeneous across settings. And this is where I think there needs to be a lot more work done to try to identify what are the sorts of places where you get where larval source management could be cost effective and more you know both effective and cost effective and what are the places where, where it's not and then and then the flip side of this is what are the places where when you're working in the world and you do something to kill adult mosquitoes that the dominant effect size is that you've depleted the local populations and driven them locally extinct rather than that you've actually reduced the sporozoite rate so, I mean, you don't know where in your process you actually got the effect. You know, if the, if the mosquitoes go away, it could be because you reduce the human biting rate as much as that you reduce the sporozoite rate. And remember, McDonald was talking about the sporozoite rate. But, but by and large, changes in the human biting rate in, in response to control have been as large or larger than changes in the sporozoite rate. So I think, you know, this is one of the reasons why I want to come back and say, look, human biting rate, human biting rate, human biting rate is actually, or not even human biting rate, as Derek says, sensitive assay or sensitive surveillance for mosquitoes to, to you know, mosquito populations, mosquito populations measured consistently, measured using the most sensitive tests to give you informative measures. And it all depends on the setting, of course, but, but I'm not, you know, that, that, that B23 is drawing attention to the fact that there are important feedbacks that McDonald's formula ignored that occur even just killing adult mosquitoes, there will be feedbacks through the ecology. And one can, can guess, right, if there's strong density dependence in your system, that those feedbacks are gonna be weak. But if there's weak density dependence in your system and you're, you sort of have a population that's mostly not regulated, then, then those effects could be quite large. And as you move from place to place, different things can be regulating your mosquito populations. And so understanding a bit about which factors matter where, uh, it would seem to be a really critical question for planning effective vector control. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot for that, uh, uh, Michelle. I think, I think, uh, uh, we move to the next one. Hi, Fred. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Dave, a question to you. Um, and, and I know we've discussed elimination quite a bit. Um, but then one of the questions is how do we measure zero? How do we really measure the absence of, of, an, of infections? Uh, wow. No, yeah. an, an, there was a, a related question on the chat, but go ahead as well. Um, yeah, I think it's a really hard question. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes here is the, the discovery of coelacanths in the ocean, which were thought to have been extinct for millions of years, <laughs> right? I mean, so just because you don't see something for a long time doesn't mean it's not there. And so this is the problem with surveillance of very low, um, very rare events is that you could be consistently missing things. So the low, at high transmission, I think EIR is, is probably the ideal measure. As you move down, HBR is telling you something about the presence of mosquitoes with the potential to transmit malaria, but whether malaria is occurring in an area uh, and sort of under the cover of 
you know, maybe you have a variant of the parasite that's avirulent, completely avirulent and just being passed along among people without detection or in a population that never seeks care. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, statistically it's a nightmare. One of my favorite stories is from uh, Tom Mysell who he, he went up this road in a village in Haiti and 10 years ago, they found a, 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 this one village in an area that's otherwise got very low transmission where they had high prevalence. And they, by camp, went up that same road 10 years later and they found um, high prevalence again. So there was, you know, in an area where you would guess that there's almost no transmission occurring, they actually found that there was this little pocket of transmission that they missed over and over again in a place where people are far from health centers and not uh, not being detected by the health system. So I, um, uh, I'm missing the name on this, but um, uh, sorry, I'm getting older and I can't remember names all the time. There has been some work on the statistics of this and um, I'll remember her name, who led it, but um, yeah, it's, it's the, the truth in the, in, of the matter is we don't know. We're relying on people to come into the clinic with malaria to tell us that there's malaria present in most of these areas. Or you have a massive blood surveillance to look for parasites. And, um, but, I, but I think the thing to recognize is that the methods that were in place to enhance surveillance to do massive blood surveys, to try and identify the last pockets of transmission that they do eventually work and malaria does seem to go away. I don't think anyone would argue credibly today that there are still pockets of local malaria transmission occurring in the United States or France, for example. And at some point uh, after a long period of, of not observing parasites, you have to admit that parasites are probably not present. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that uh... Uh, Professor Lyons, uh, Joe Lyons is still on the call because we, we had a question on stickiness uh, of, of malaria and uh, he tried to explain this to us last time. So in, in case Joe is still there, it might be uh, helpful. Um, but yeah, I'm here. Um, yes. Dave, Dave, the point is this, uh, in that Zanzibar elimination report, uh, it was pointed out that if the Aboriginal natural background R0 is less than 10 or 20, I think the figures were, then a super duper fast reaction, ever so thorough surveillance and quick reaction system should be able to find imported infections and the resulting local transmission and squash out those sparks before they lead to a fire. But, and this is the point for me, in a lot of Zanzibar, background EIRs, background R0 is greater than this. And so what that implies is that elimination in Zanzibar is only stable if we keep vector control up forever until global eradication of the parasite occurs. Do you think that's fair or, or what is it? The question involves this stickiness, which we haven't talked about today before, so, so please explain that again. First of all, hi, Joe. Long time no see. Um, nice to see your face again. The, uh, so the idea of stickiness is, it came out of this uh, examination of malaria um, transmission in countries that used to have malaria, but now don't. So the United States, France, you can see the list of countries on the right-hand side in the lower that, that had published lists of malaria cases with a, some guess about what fraction of the cases had been imported versus what fraction were locally transmitted. And what you're seeing by and large is that, you know, places like France and the United States have had a large number of cases imported and a very small number of local transmission events. But there are a couple of examples there that are worth noting. Um, Mauritius is one where it had eliminated malaria and then 
uh, there was a cyclone and malaria was introduced into aid, by AIDS workers into this disrupted environment and transmission resumed. The, the hypothesis for why something like that could happen though, because France still has vectors and the US still has vectors. Uh, one hypothesis is that the ecology has changed and the vectors have gone away. Another hypothesis is that something about the behaviors have changed. So Hackett describes the evolution or the, the changes in blood feeding behaviors by European mosquitoes. Um, this is a 1937 publication, but he's describing how mosquitoes that used to transmit are no longer found in houses and they're no longer found with human blood. So they're, they've evolved. The species no longer transmit. There's another hypothesis that as mosquito, as human populations become more wealthy, they just devote more time to and more resources to healthcare. And so nobody who has the time and resources would tolerate being infected with malaria. You feel bad, you go get treated. You either go on chemo prophylaxis continuously or you're vigilant and every time you have any sign of infection, you treat. And if you can afford to do that and you have the means and the knowledge, that's very easy to do. But there's another possibility, which is that there are still some places in these areas where transmission potentially at least is very high and could restart. And the hypothesis is that once immunity has waned sufficiently to malaria, that virtually everyone who gets it is gonna get sick and seek care or almost everyone. And so remember we can say R0 for malaria could be very high, 2000, but that's 2,000 cases spread out over quite a long time. And the generation time is also very long, right? So counting, I don't know how many of you have ever done this in your heads, but six days in the liver, let's say 10 days for gametocytes to mature and 10 days for sporozoites. So minimally 26 days for parasites to get from one mosquito back to a mosquito takes a long time. It's a month, of, and minimally a month of a delay. So someone comes in, you see a bunch of cases, they can't really start transmitting for another month. You have time to ramp up a control activity and be ready. And, you know, it doesn't always work. I think there, there's a the Virgin Islands or Barbados, there's an example that in, the, in America's where there was an outbreak, and it took them a few years to control it, but they did recontrol it. If you look in this case, Mauritius did recontrol. And so the idea is that with control measures, you can ramp up control in a responsive way to stop outbreaks and effectively keep a, a place malaria free, even though it hasn't been eradicated everywhere. Now, I think one of the examples uh, that we should draw our attention to is South Korea, where we, we know it's a very wealthy country now, right? highly economically development, developed, good infection control. And yet they have this neighbor that has a lot of malaria transmission and the demilitarized zone is an area where obviously there are now mosquitoes and parasites come across the border. So malaria used to be absent from South Korea. And now I think everyone who's a uh, paying attention, we have to admit there's some local transmission and evidence for it up along the DMZ, while the rest of South Korea remains absolutely free. So there is some local effect that you probably can't erase. And this suggests that malaria elimination, if you're gonna roll it out as a strategy, has to be thought of as a, as a regional strategy. You can't get rid of malaria and make it sticky in a small area by itself. And so sticky is going to apply to sort of broad regional efforts in, that are coordinated across big zones. But I do think that once you get rid of a malaria in a big, highly connected region, and I'm talking about highly connected by human movement now, as well as by parasite transmission, that cases being imported are rare enough that you can afford to mount an overwhelming response to, damp to, to stamp them out. So this is one of the reasons why elimination, I think, worked in Europe. And it's probably not going to roll back ever. And it worked in the United States, and it's not going to roll back almost ever. And is, there, is there any likelihood that uh, if you were to eliminate malaria in uh, you know, a lot of African countries have malaria elimination agenda, what is the chance of achieving stickiness? If, if we were to do this 
in 2030, for example. If GTS were to become a reality and, and uh, Nuri is on the call, uh, Nuri, it would be nice to, to hear you speak on this as well. If, if uh, um, you know, let's say Mozambique or, or Uganda were to actually achieve the, the, goal, the targets as originally envisioned in GTS, what are the chances that there would be stickiness uh, that we would sustain zero? Oh, is that is that even a relevant question, actually? I guess the question is whether you can engineer it. But it's not it's not something that's going to happen entirely by itself. Yeah. And um, my personal opinion here, and I think it's you know it's it's very hard to to try this experimentally, but that if you want sticky elimination, that the the most important component of that is to have a, a well-functioning health system, to have really, really good health care available to most of your population in a mostly healthy state across most of your region. So that trying to get a place to be sticky by just getting rid of the mosquitoes is unlikely to work. It's this human part of the equation that matters. And, the, and you know, having people who understand that they shouldn't be sick, right? I mean, if you're in, in a highly malaria endemic area and infected with malaria basically every day, you may not be in the clinic every day, but you have subclinical disease that's highly prevalent and you feel awful a lot of the time. And those people are gonna wait to go to the clinic longer for everything. And that puts a huge drag on the health system. So it's a good reason to try to get rid of malaria, but it's also a recognition that, that this kind of getting rid of malaria and improving health overall have to kind of go hand in hand. And I don't think malaria is the only thing that really makes it hard to get your health system up to snuff. But if you have this huge drag on your health system from malaria, you know, you need so many resources for people to come in for every possible reason because they're sick, they're sick, they feel awful, right? I mean, in, in, the, in the malaria data we have from Pororo, we asked people about their history of fever. This is a self-reported fever. And basically one eighth of the population self-reports fever, right? So one day out of eight, you're feeling poorly enough that you're going to tell a doctor you think you've had a fever. And if that, that's a really high baseline level of disease in these populations. Yeah. How do you improve care? So you get rid of malaria, and now you still have a system that's sort of overloaded. And, and over time, that system evolves to a point where disease is rare, and people are willing to go for fever to a clinic. And now you're in a position where perhaps you could get rid of and make it sticky. But I do, I do think it's that development of the health system forms the bedrock response to all of this. And I think one of the ways to do that is in an elimination campaign to keep your focus on entomological or not entomological, on uh, parasitological surveillance and building up your health system so you're pretty sure that you would see a case, right? And this is what happened in the GMAP. It wasn't just three to five years of uh, IRS that brought malaria or mosquito populations really down in prevalence to, you know, within three to five years, within 1% of what it had been. It was more about what happened in the next 10 to 15 years when they came in and they tried to build up surveillance systems to the point where they could prove to the WHO that they had actually eliminated malaria locally. And under those circumstances, they were also building up the health system to a point where, you know, they were doing their testing and improving the surveillance capacity of that system so that they would know. Well, one of the side benefits was it probably improved healthcare for all of the people visiting those clinics. And I think it's that second part, you get rid of malaria and then you improve the system. And at some point you get to a point where malaria is gonna have a really hard time reestablishing, even in areas where, you know, r not is a thousand. Thanks, thanks, thanks. I think we go back to Shayla. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Um, yes, thanks, Fred. So, um, Dev, um, it, it's it's nice to to know that maybe it's not nice in terms of um, economically, but we understand that it's good to sort of 
continue with our vector control interventions. But the reality in the malaria control programs is that um, the financial situation is really bad. Um, it's, it's, they have limited financial budgets for vector control. And therefore, always they're asking these questions, especially if they're in that pre-elimination or elimination phase. They'd want to know um, how safe it is to sort of withdraw vector control interventions and if it's, it's at all possible to predict resurgence. In relation to this, could you please talk to us about uh, McDonald's, uh, Ross McDonald's theory of elimination and resurgence? Yeah, I think it's very simple. In a nutshell, if you take away vectorial interventions, vector-based interventions, malaria is going to come back. That's it. <laughs> it almost always plays out. <laughs> but we have examples where malaria didn't come back. Yeah, what that's an you? interesting yeah. one, isn't it? I don't fully understand what's gone on there. Um, I mean, it could be some of the stickiness, right? Where people people's behavior of you get rid of malaria for long enough and most of the people start behaving differently. So they actually, you know, the care seeking behaves and it's hard to get transmission restarted in some of those settings. But Dave, Dave when you talk about this stickiness, you, you, you're kind of constantly referring to human behavior and health systems. But I mean, I, I can see comments on the line here about things that just, you know, house improvement. What do you say to that? And, and actually, in your stickiness paper, you also talk about development. So, uh, in re relation to what Shayla is asking, you know, does it mean we just continue until the country is fully developed or until the health system is built? Or? You guys are the entomologists. I'm going to boot this back to you. <laughs> uh, so what you'd be positing, though, is if it doesn't come back, that there has been some kind of permanent change to mosquito populations, which is entirely yeah. possible through economic yeah. development or land use changes or improved housing or various other things. So it is possible to change or not, right? The baseline does change over time in these settings. So I guess the question is, to push it back, is if there hasn't been any change to the baseline from other factors changing over time, then you will see resurgence. But if, you know, this is short of stickiness and some change in human behavior, and I think there are lots of examples where we've seen permanent changes to mosquito populations, right? And it's not just mosquito populations. You guys are aware, I think, of massive changes in insect populations across the world in response to increased use of pesticides and insecticides more broadly. And um, it could be some of that. Uh, I don't, I mean, I know that in some cases, elimination of mosquito populations has been an outcome of uh, vector control efforts. So Malabo is a good case in point where two of the species that used to be principally involved in, uh, in transmission disappeared pretty quickly after the uh, ALEP of IRS. And then, but we now, have, we still have Calusii present. So if Calusii hadn't been present, you would have seen malaria just go away. And then we'd be waiting for recolonization of the area by one of those vector species. So it's not really a permanent change but it's a, you know, for the short term, it, it's a, it's a it definitely an important change that would have allowed you to stop doing vector-based interventions for a time until malaria came back. South Africa saw this, right? They got rid of um, some of their vectors when the IRS, and uh, sorry, when IRS was done with DDP back in the 1950s, and then I think it was Funetis came back in the meantime. Uh, and then when they and then they got rid of it again after sort of switching back to DDP or something like that. There's a long, complicated story, and I'm sure there are some people here who can tell it. So there can be permanent changes to the vector populations in an area. Uh, my friend Steve Lindsay told me a, a lovely story about a study he wanted to do about urban malaria transmission in Uganda when people started doing local yam farming, and then somebody came in and built a factory on the yam farm, and malaria transmission ceased. And it's things like that that actually do happen and change, permanently change the conditions of malaria transmission in an area. Um, and housing quality, I think, is we're, we've seen lots of evidence over the years that this is, you know, let's face it, if you can improve people's housing quality, what's the downside? 
I mean, if it reduces transmission sort of permanently and it makes them live under better conditions, that seems like a win-win to me. So anything we can do to improve housing seems like a great idea. I just don't think we understand what are the permanent big changes in mosquito ecology we're also causing. And maybe we're underestimating the magnitude of those effects mathematically. Yeah. It seems like a great research question. Sheila, any additional questions? Um, I guess maybe like if you wanted, I'm still on the question of withdrawing vector control interventions. So um, when you're modeling this, because obviously it's unethical and it's unsafe to withdraw these vector control interventions, that, but most programs want sort of to model what it would, it would look like if you withdraw, say if you are implementing IRS, what would happen if you stop? So what, what are some of the parameters that you would put in a given model? What are some of the data sets that you would need for this? I mean, I think the data that I've seen suggests that most of the time, if you withdraw IRS, malaria is going to come roaring back. But I'm thinking now of the 10 districts in uh, northern Uganda that were under IRS control. It was removed and malaria came roaring back. Um, one of the questions I've had about this, though, is, right, um, so why Zanzibar? Why did that happen? Um, for those of you who have read some of the older stuff, do you remember the Pare Tevedo malaria scheme? So this is the 19, it's, it's sprang there, you know, after some baseline studies, sprang starts in 1957 and goes for three and a half years and then stops. And that was the point of the study because they wanted to measure the potential for rebound. But long after that, this is one of the areas that seems to maybe have had some positive benefits from having a, a, even a very short period without malaria. And you know, it's something I don't understand, but maybe, the, maybe mosquito ecology does change permanently you know, because they, they compete with other mosquito species, right? They probably have symbiotic relationships with a large number of bacterial species and other you know, symbiotic relationships, that, you know, mutualisms that are helping them persist and create an environment out there that's suitable for them. They might have problems finding mate, these the, the Ali effects. They could have a long time, a, a hard time recolonizing areas that they've depleted because they can't find mates or something other, uh, other things that are going on. You know, right now, I don't think we have enough of a basis for telling people it's okay to remove vector, vector control, even though some places it, it, we've removed it, it's been okay. But I haven't seen studies that have said, well, you know, in the meantime, we understand what's changed about the system. So we can, can we explain, for example, why malaria prevalence remains low in Zanzibar, despite, uh, you know, has coverage remained high? Maybe that's it. Or if coverage hasn't remained high, then why hasn't malaria come back at the levels it has before? Those, are, those kinds of studies are urgently needed if we're ever going to give advice, because you also have, you know, for every Zanzibar, you have a, in a district in northern Uganda where removing IRS, you had a, you know, not just resurgence, but maybe even a, a rebound where it came back for a time with more intensive transmission than before because you'd lost some uh, anti-gametocyte immunity or you'd lost some transmission blocking immunity and all of a sudden, you know, you've got massive numbers of parasites. So I, I don't think I'm, I would not give the advice that it's okay to remove vector control at this stage. And I don't think we have the evidence or the understanding to give that, to say where you can and can't. So don't. In fact, I would say the opposite is true that we need more investment in malaria control. And I, I don't want to get into the sort of what's the right way to do this, but you know, whatever it is, something that's durable and lasting is good if you can do it. Something that involves cultural change and changing cultural norms is good. Something that involves local capacity building is good. However you decide to do it, it needs to be sustainable over time because I, I, I think we're all, we're not going to argue in this forum, but malaria is a problem that needs to go away. 
And I'm very, very committed to that for the rest of my life. That I'm, you know, that's something I'm going to be working on. But I do think it needs more money from somewhere or, or more, more research to understand how to answer your question, Shayla. I don't know how to answer it. Because I would say, don't. Don't stop doing vector control. You need it until malaria is gone. Yeah. I don't if, this is, this is, this is that's, that's a fantastic point to, to, to probably end our discussion. We, we are coming to three hours uh, of a long conversation. <laughs> uh, you started at 4 a.m. in uh, your hometown. Uh, and you've been on it for a very long time. So I guess at this point, uh, I'm going to do two things. One is to ask um, our colleagues who are on the line. Um, we have a number of colleagues who've been helping greatly uh, responding to questions on the chat box. Uh, Eli, uh, Amelie, um, Yalin, uh, if any one of you guys would like to make a comment uh, directly with Dev, we can use the last uh, uh, two, three minutes to do that. Uh, and then I know that we have uh, a very particular question from uh, um, uh, our colleague in the NMCP in Nigeria. So if, if he's still on the line, I think, I think that when we take and then we just, we just bring this to a close. So um, please. I don't know how to how to make a call, but Ellie, do, do you guys have any comments uh, that you would like to make? I don't know, just to say thank you. That was fascinating. Really enjoyed the the, the discussion and uh, learned a lot. So thank you all. That's great. And, and thank you as well. Thank you guys so much. Thanks to everybody who's been participating on the chat box, responding to the questions. This has been really, really great. Um, and if any of us um, colleagues are, are, are willing to say something, please just let me know. Do we do we still have our colleague from the Nigerian NMCP, uh, Udoka? Uh, are you, do you still want to make your comment? Are you still on the line? Ah, finally, I didn't realize that Patricia was on the line as well. Um, Patricia, thanks. It's nice, nice that you're on the line. Do you have any, any comments for Dave or for us? Uh, no, not really at the moment. Just, just listening with interest. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think at this point, then I just return this to Shayla and, and then David, and then we can pause. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Fred. Um, thank you very much, Dev, for um, gracing our masterclass today. Um, it was very, very insightful, very informative, very fantastic discussions happening. So thank you very much. Thanks, Shayla. Thank you, Fred. And I've been just had a chance to sort of glance at some of the chat going on. Do you know if the, is the chat going to be memorialized? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll, I'll print the whole of it. I'll send you a PDF of all the chat Perfect. chats, uh, so you can you can uh, respond to this as well, uh, uh, and then so the record as well will be available. And this was being streamed live on our YouTube channel, so people can view it uh, now and afterwards as well. I really enjoyed our discussion. So thank you, Shayla. Thanks, Chris, and thanks to everyone who is working in the background. Yes. Pay attention to you too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so so much, and to everybody who's been staying with us. There was like 320 of us in the beginning, and even three hours later, there's still 100 plus uh, person sitting. We're very grateful for that. We hope you find it useful, and hopefully next uh, uh, week we are able to join us as well. Uh, we are waiting for confirmation, but we have some very nice uh, uh, masterclasses lined up as well. Again, this, uh, this masterclasses are completely 100% are free of charge. You do not need to pay anything. Um, it's really for people interested to come in and, uh, and participate. Um, and uh, do let us know if you have any suggestions for improvements as well. And again, thank you very, very much to my colleague Shayla and to everybody who's supporting in the background. And thanks a lot again, David. I think we're going to bring this to a close and may you have a wonderful week ahead.